basketball and stay out of the way of the adults that run the world. I never bought that. Nothing in this world, nothing works the way you think it does. There's always more to the story. That the reason why I'm here doing what I'm doing is because of this mutation which is being foisted on the human race. It's being forced on the human race, this change that the masters of the universe, so to speak, have in mind for the human race is being foisted on us. And I believe, again, just by opinion, that that's what I'm, that's my part in, in this uh, cosmic scheme or this cosmic play is to, is to call people back to their humanity and let them know you're being led down the garden path into something you don't know what's coming. You know, I, I can't stand it when people say that, that this is all high technology of, the, you know, of our government. No, I don't buy that for a minute. What I've seen with my own eyes, I don't buy it for a minute. If it has anything to do with our government, then what, the, what I have actually witnessed with my own eyes, if it is, has, has to do with U.S. government, then that means that the U.S. government is in league with extraterrestrials because what I saw is, is extraterrestrial in origin. But I am totally convinced that there is now on the earth, again for a lack of a better term, alien presence which are the enemies of the human race. And they are obviously enemies of whoever the original creators of us because of the things I've been told, that the people or the entities who created us, the gods who created us, have enemies out there in the universe. Something I want to say about Spielberg, and I have many, many, many friends in the industry, and I already know, because I've been told, that virtually all the major names in Hollywood know who I am and what I'm, they should. I've been talking for 48 years. <laughs> And they're using all my stuff now, so they should know me. But, and so I'm saying that I am totally convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, for myself, that there are such things as reptile aliens. Though I have never seen one, thank God, but I totally believe they are here. Not because of David Icke, not because of Krito Mutwa, who I love listening to, a wonderful, fascinating man. David Icke has done great stuff. But I believe uh, extra, there are reptile alien aliens here because of my own personal research. Be aware that there is a war for your soul. We'll talk about it. You better get uh, I, think, I think we start capturing updates now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> OK. And that goes for you, too. <laughs> Watch the bell. <laughs> Watch I rough my rules, all right? No yeah, cameras, yeah, no, ca no, no comments from the side, from the, from the peanut gallery, unless they are invited. Well, yeah, all right? Are we on, all on the same page? <laughs> Let's have a clap. Okay. And action. Jordan Maxwell. I am very excited to be here with you today and Bill Ryan and I, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, uh, couldn't be more thrilled to have this honor of, of interviewing you. You're one of the preeminent researchers, you've been on the scene for over 40 years. Um, I think you're really responsible for David Icke and Zachariah Sitchin and I don't know, numerous others coming to the fore talking about secret societies, the Illuminati, and, and, and really the powers that be behind the scenes. And, uh, 
And there's just no doubt that, the, that everyone, Hoagland, I mean, you name it, even Wilcock, everyone owes you a great thank you for, for, for bringing this subject matter to the fore and for your amazingly diligent research in this area. Um, you're an amazing mind. You're, you're really, uh, I, I, you're a national treasure, if you don't mind my saying so, um, here in America. And I know you, you've been noticed overseas in that, in that respect as well. So um, what do you have to say for yourself? Can, can you give a better introduction than that? I would say that you are being, you're, you are being very generous and very kind, and um, I appreciate all your words. But I, I view myself as just an ordinary person just doing what I love to do, and that is to look behind the scenes of world events, <clears throat> how things really work. And um, I started doing this kind of research diligently. I, I grew up, as, even as a child, spending most of my time in the library where all the other kids were out playing. I was sitting in libraries, and so I've always been interested to know things that other people don't seem to even know exist. And I've always been interested in the secret side of life, all of the hidden things in the world that, uh, that most people are not even aware of. I'm just fascinated with how much there is to know that most people don't even know exist. Um, and so I, I grew up thinking that way, and by the time I was 19 years old, when I ended up in Los Angeles, I decided to dedicate my whole life to studying um, what, I, what I would call the world of the occult. The word occult simply means hidden. And so much of real knowledge and wisdom is hidden, because the people who run this planet feel that uh, true knowledge and wisdom of how the world really works is uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's knowledge that you don't need to know. And all you need to do is just go out and do your job and have fun and watch your basketball and stay out of the way of the adults that run the world. I never bought that. When I was a child, I used to, of course, be happy when my family would have other families coming over to visit because they would bring their children and I would have people, I'd have kids to play with. But uh, after dinner, <clears throat> the women would always end up in a group and they're talking women talk. And my dad and his brothers and whoever else was there, they, all the men would go in the front room and smoke the cigars and have the wine and and uh, talk men talk. And so my dad and my uncle especially would always say, well, you guys, you kids go on out and play ball. And I, I would tell my uncle, because I loved my, my, my dad's brothers were wonderful. I loved them all. And so I would tell my uncle, I don't want to go out and play ball. I want to hear what you guys are talking about. Because I'm assuming if you want me to go out and play ball that you're going to talk about something you don't want me to hear. I'm real curious to hear what you want to talk about that you don't want me to hear about. And so I even as a kid... I used to say that to them. I, uh, yeah. Really, yeah. So you're incredibly precocious, basically. Yeah, and so, and my, and so my, them, what they would do is my uncle and my dad would say, well, we'll go out and play. We'll go out and play too. You know, acting like, okay, we don't, we don't need to talk about anything. So we would go out. And of course, all the kids would now want to go out because my dad and my uncle is going to be playing with us. So we would all go out to play ball because now the adults with, with us. And of course, about 10 minutes into the game, my dad would get tired, you know, because he works all day, so he's tired and that kind of story. So he comes in and then my uncle a few minutes later would come in. But now the kids are, well, now we're playing ball, so now we, we, we're happy. I, I see that today. Um, the President of the United States goes to the opening ball game and he throws out the first ball. That's Daddy throwing out the first ball for all the kids to be there. And all the kids are watching their little silly ball games. And uh, then, of course, they would shoot into the audience of the ball games and you see the movie stars and big name politicians there watching the game. And I think, you know, I know what that is. It's just 
the guys who are running the planet want all the uh, the, the poor people, uh, <clears throat> all the kids to to know that uh, we're adults who are running the world. We're, we're human like you. We like to come out to the basketball game and see the, the ball games. And it kind of makes everyone feel kind of happy that our national leaders and our movie stars are like us. They love the ball games too. I never fell for that. I know what's going on. These guys couldn't care less, but it's just politics. It's just, um, you know, go out and let the people see that you are human like everyone else. I never bought it. I want to know about what these guys are talking about at 2 o'clock in the morning when everyone else is asleep. That's when these guys talk. Absolutely. And so, <laughs> um, can you possibly feel comfortable enough to share what you shared with us last night about the meeting with that very special person? Uh, the, the one with the yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. I'm just trying to think. Am I comfortable talking about it? I understand. <clears throat> um, well, let me go on first and, and, and lay some more foundation. All right. So, I, I, it it didn't take me very long to figure out that so much of what is going on, humans are not being told. We are not being told the real truth. And I'm going to, a couple of things in particular I want you to know and I want you to re remember. Nothing in this world, nothing works the way you think it does. There's always more to the story. You hear about some marriage breaking up and the husband did this, the wife did that, and it's very obvious what happened. No, it's not obvious what happened. There's a lot more to the story you don't know. You don't know her background, her past. You don't know his past. You don't know what was going on in the family. You have no idea. So it's nothing is simple. This is why you have courts. So I found that nothing in this world operates the way you think it does. Banks do not loan money. Governments are not empowered to protect you. Uh, police department is not there to serve you. Um, institutions of higher learning, colleges and educational institutes are not there to educate you. The entire superstructure of civilization in the Western world is a, is a combination of brilliantly put together and planned, well planned schemes to direct the I to direct the minds of the people in such a way as to serve their masters. And I've known that for a long time. And one of the biggest uh, uh, tools in the hands of the masters who run this world is Hollywood. Hollywood is an incredible story. Uh, I've said this, and maybe many hearing me now have heard me say this, but I'll say it again, that <clears throat> the white man's establishment comes from Europe. And in northern, southern well, all four, all Northeast, South, and Western Europe, uh, even at the time of the Roman Empire and before, that whole section of Europe that we call the center for the white man's presence on the earth <clears throat> was, was quite literally ruled over. Uh, ancient Europe was ruled over by a priesthood called the Druids. And the Druids were very, they were the, they were the ministers, the, the priests, the judges, the lawyers, uh, they were the religious leaders, so there was a priesthood that dominated Europe. It still does. Europe is still a Druidic country, and America is a Druidic country. And unless you understand the Druidic system, then you're never going to figure out what's going on in America and England. <clears throat> but one of the most important symbols in the Druid system was a magic wand like Merlin, the magician with the magic wand, and also um, the orchestra leaders and conductors always have a magic wand. And you have better played the tune of the master. He directs you to play, and he directs you to stop with the magic wand. So you're dancing to his music, okay? Magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. It's made out of holly wood. And Hollywood is a Druidic establishment. And the symbols, the words, the terms, the stories are designed. Think about it. Think about how Hollywood does what they do. 
I'm not saying they're evil. I'm just explaining how Hollywood works. You have, first of all, a story. So somebody has to write the story. All right, so now you've got a story. Now you have to give it to a screenwriter who's going to adapt that story, <coughs> excuse me, adapt that story into a screenplay. Because you can't just tell the story. You have to design it to be a movie. Now once you do that, then you're going to have to have the actors, very important actors, um, because they, you're going to need people to act the part. And, and so it doesn't mean that they, are, they, they actually have human feelings. No, no, they're being paid to act like they care, to act like they love someone, to, it's an act. And so you're paying actors to act out the part that the screenwriters have written, and you want to make sure the actors do it just right. So you have to have a director, and he's going to direct everything you say and do the way he wants it said. Then you have, of course, the producer, and he's also subjected to the executive producer who's producing the money. And so all of this is a whole system <clears throat> of putting together a system of a story <clears throat> that tells you a story. It, it, it causes you to think in terms of what you just saw so that people go out from the movie and think in their minds, this is the way you normally would react to a situation, the way that the guy in the movie did. And so that's why today, in the Western civilization, especially in the West, our, <clears throat> our ability to work with each other and live together as humans is so screwed up. Because we've been watching so much television and so many movies, and so much silliness coming out of Hollywood, so much violence and sex and drugs and all the rest of it, that people have no idea in the world how to live anymore. <clears throat> They've lost their humanity. Okay, so you're saying that in many ways Hollywood movies and television are actually sort of doing behavior modification Precisely. on people to get them to behave in certain ways to think is socially acceptable and then people actually go out and they, they act the way they're supposed to act rather than the way they really feel in That's any right. given situation. Exactly. Precisely. So it cements yes. the social structure. That's and, it. And, and I, I do understand that. Would you also talk about how movies are revealing the Illuminati agenda? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> what a story that is. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> even more so than you know. Even more so than you suspect. Uh, I have been doing, uh, I have been looking at one subject for, uh, well, since 1967. <clears throat> in Glendale, California, let me preface this. In Glendale, California, 1967, I was uh, researching communism for a lecture I was going to give. <clears throat> and I went to um, a World Book Encyclopedia. And there was a picture of the National Coat of Arms of the Soviet Union and the Soviet flag. And, I, and, and that was in 67. Well, I started speaking uh, to small little groups in 60. So for seven years, I'd already been talking to little mom and pop groups and little library rooms and all that, and little bookstores and all that kind of thing. <clears throat> but it was in 67 that I came across a symbol <clears throat> which was the national coat of arms of the Soviet Union. And I, had, I, I was familiar by that time with a particular term that the communists have used, the Nazis have used, the British have used, the Americans have used. And the more I began to... And the, so when I saw the symbol and the term and the explanation for the symbol in the World Book Encyclopedia, it finally hit me that something is going on on a massive, enormous scale around the world, and for the first time I saw it in the Soviet National Coat of Arms, because it was using the same words and terms that the Hitler had used, the Nazis had used, that the fascists had used in Italy, and now as I begin to look, the, uh, the people of India used it, the governments around the world are using the same symbol, and so I knew that I had stumbled upon something of profound significance. I didn't know what it was, 
but I already knew I had a gut feeling that something is really big going on on the earth. And the Soviet national coat of arms was what triggered my catching it. When you talked about the symbols there, um, that <coughs> reminded me how, how, how much of your work is about the interpretation of symbols. And somebody mentioned to me that you were actually the model for the symbologist that was played by Tom Hanks in the movie Da Vinci Code, The Da Vinci Code. Can you say anything about that? Is, is it true that that was based on your work and, and on your personality and your research? Well, I'm not, I'm not in a position to say for sure because I, I'm, I'm not privy to you know, how they came up with what they, what they did in the movie. All I will say that is for sure and provable is that in 1991, I think it was, I did a, um, a presentation that was videotaped uh, in Pasadena area at a bookstore, and the video is out all over the world. It's called the Basic Slide Presentation. <clears throat> and in that, uh, that was back in 1991, Pasadena, I was introduced as a uh, as an expert expert on secret societies and occult emblems and symbols of religion and government and I woke up onto the stage and I it was a slide presentation that I was doing and so I had the slide projector on and the slide that was being projected on the screen I left it on you know even before I started I uh, just to have a picture for people to see when they came in so the slide projector was already on and the picture that was on the screen was the back of the dollar bill the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill and when I walked up onto the platform, I walked in front of the screen, so now it's being projected on me. That was on the movie. And then I started pointing to <laughs> the symbols on the dollar bill and explaining the emblems of words. That's exactly the same scene that's in the movie. I remember it. It's very dramatic. It was yeah, and go back and get my basic flyer presentation back in 91, and it's the same identical thing. Imitation <clears throat> is the sincerest form of flattery. Right, I guess. <laughs> Of course, I didn't get a check or anything, and uh, and then of course in 1992 or 93, something like that, I did a video called Matrix of Power, in which I talked about how the world is being uh, manipulated behind the scenes by occult or magical symbols and words that are deceiving civilization, deceiving people, and then later on a movie comes out called Ma uh, Matrix. But uh, I have been talking about this, you know, this subject for many, many years before. Now, one thing a lot of people do not know is that I was going around, <clears throat> it can be told now, but I was going around to studios in the 70s and in the early 80s, especially in the 70s. Uh, I was going around to all the motion picture studios at nighttime um, or groups, uh, working class people in the studios would have me come in and do a presentation on uh, slide projector, you know, just a little Mickey Mouse operation, slide projector, throw up a screen, and I would uh, give lectures on Bible codes, uh, Knights Templars, <clears throat> secret societies, uh, and those, those kind of arcane subjects. And many times I would give lectures like that to just the working class people of the studio, and then sometimes we would rent uh, some office within the studio lot where I could go and sit and talk with a bunch of people who are working at the studio. And I was just having fun talking about things I enjoy. You know, they would order beer and pizza, we'd sit and talk, and I would do a two, hour, two or three hour slide presentation on Bible codes, uh, secret societies. And in 66, late 66, as I said before, I learned about the Illuminati as such. <clears throat> and so I started in uh, giving lectures at the studios on Illuminati Masonic orders, uh, both the British Grand Lodge and the American Freemasonry, uh, the French and German orders, and, and tying them all into the secret societies that operate around the globe. And, uh, and, and, and also incorporating in those lectures, as I said, in the 70s, the subject of Illuminati, which I had gotten from Anthony Helder's uh, records that were put out 
1966. And so today I see, you know, on television, on History Channel, and all kinds of movies from Hollywood talking about Illuminati. It's actually come from your research. It's been, it's, it's percolated itself down into the popular culture. Well, I mean, if you just keep talking for 48 years, somebody's going to finally hear you somewhere. <laughs> well, it's very possible that they were actually filming and taping you at the studio. Line. Well, I know they did. Actually, they, they were doing it, but there was like individuals who had their cameras and were videotape, and they were audio tape. <clears throat> but even behind the scenes, there could have been recording uh, going on. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of what you talked about has shown up in plot lines, in screenplays, and, oh, yeah. and, and then in movies, obviously. Absolutely. So yeah. maybe we can go back again to where you got involved in... You, you were talking about the Soviet crest, and, and maybe we could pick up there. Yeah, and so this was in 67. Um, 1967, as I said, I'm in Glendale, California. I was researching uh, the communist movement, uh, and so I went to the World Book Encyclopedia, and there in the World Book Encyclopedia was a picture of the national coat of arms of the Soviet Union and the communist flag. And I, underst I already understood the symbols of the communist flag, but my eye caught that national coat of arms. And I saw in that symbol something I had seen the Nazis use, <clears throat> all, the, all the great nations of the world have used, all the presidents of the United States in their inaugural addresses use the same words and terms, all the senators and congressmen when they're running for office use that same term, that same symbol. And so I knew I had stumbled upon something of profound significance. I just didn't know what it meant, but I knew it's important. This is in 67. And so since 67, I have been researching this one uh, term, this one symbol, and, and, and the more I find on it, the more I'm amazed at how much there is out there on this one secret symbol that nobody is aware that it's right in front of you. It's one of those incredibly fantastic stories of something that is so awesome in scope and it's sitting right in front of you and you never saw it. That's how clever these guys are. So, how, so what are you talking about? Because you said there, I mean, we're going to put it on the screen. There's two mountains right. and a rising sun. Right. Is that right? Right. So what are the words but, and but, what, is the, what does this mean? But in order, it, look at, just, just to be able to see it, which you, you will be able to put into the video, but just to be able to see it is not sufficient. You need about 25 or 30 years of research to understand the significance of what you're seeing and what it actually means. So you'll be able to show it and it will be something of interest that people will pick up on. But believe me, there's a bigger story yet. So when you are hearing the term Illuminati or the concepts of secret societies, occult orders, and all that kind of thing, it's actually much bigger than you think. There's something far bigger going on on the earth okay, the that most people sun, are not aware of. Are we talking about the rising sun? Are we talking about the rising of the New World Order? We're talking that's right, about, exactly. Uh, we're also talking about something else, aren't yes, we? That's right, something very big. Something, something more Something goes all the way now. back into B.C., back into the ancient world. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin and I uh, have talked about this. Um, at one time, I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin. I helped send him to different countries, and we were going to do a television, uh, a 13-week mini special I was going to do with Zach. And uh, Zachariah Sitchin has been my dear friend and a brilliant man, and I was so impressed with him, I talked him into signing a contract with me to do a 13-week miniseries for television. And uh, unfortunately, the, the attorneys and the people who were financing the project for me at the last minute, after we'd already shot like five different countries, and we were almost through, they pulled the plug on the whole project. So it wasn't Zach's fault, it wasn't my fault, it was the people who were financing it, they faltered. But I've had a lot of opportunities to talk to Zachariah about things which I'm, you know, that I'm, I'm interested in. 
And I've learned a lot talking to him in private, which will unfortunately have to stay private. But Okay, so you're not able to tell anything about uh, something that he told you that was actually very serious. Well, no, it's just that uh, the symbol I'm talking about is on the National Coat of Arms of the Soviet Union. So I would say anyone who's interested in this, look at the symbols on the National Coat of Arms and study it. Don't just look at it, but look at all the implications of it and then follow the other pictures that I have that I will give you with each one's a step closer and another step closer to it and keeps going. And I think there's about six or seven pictures. Okay, but there's, it, it also links up with the Japanese, the use of the, the, the red exactly. sun, the, also the, um, the right. sun that was in Obama's inauguration exactly. in the background. What um, about the, the Pittsburgh G20 summit? It's like a bridge. I know. Two, yeah. That's the same thing, how huh, the two bridges come yeah. together? But isn't, isn't there something, isn't there some occult significance to the sun itself? Oh, of course there is. Up here. Of course. And are we talking about something to do with the Anunnaki as well and yes. their agenda? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. There is a hidden agenda that's been in operation on this earth for thousands of years. And it's all, it's a, and see, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm trying to explain something to an audience who has not been where I've been and seen what I have. You know? And so... If, I'm having a difficulty trying to uh, legitimize what I'm saying if you you haven't seen what I've seen. And so... Okay, well that's part of the purpose of the interview. I mean, we are Camelot, we have a lot of background information already on our site, as mm -hmm. you know. And so in many ways, the, the people that are watching this will have seen, it, they'll have been already educated if they weren't, you know, to begin with. I understand. By Camelot, by the other people that have come before you. But it, I think it's very significant that we're talking now. And, um, and I think that, that, that what we've touched on here is like this is the beginning of a revealing that most people are not aware of. And, yes. and obviously, you've got that story, okay? I'm telling you, no matter how well prepared and how well read you are, I will guarantee you, you've not heard the story. Okay. I have a story no one's heard. And, uh, and I've been looking at it for some, since 67. So we're talking about what, uh, how many years is that? 67 to uh, 2007, that's what, 40 years? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And when did you actually stumble on the final, like, um, because I'm gonna feel, I feel like in a sense, you have the full meaning of it at this stage. I, I think that perhaps you have that full meaning. So I'm asking you in a sense, when did you arrive there? How many years ago did I you think, actually get to the I think probably somewhere in the mid-90s it began to really dawn on me. Okay, yeah, and dawn has something to do with it. That's right. We're also talking about, um, well, we're, we're, talking, we're about talking about an ancient, ancient story that has been... The golden dawn. We're talking about absolutely. the golden dawn and the absolutely. information there. But what... Much further back, but Golden Dawn was just one more step uh -huh. in a continuing flow of a particular idea. And as it moves into the last days of the, of the world that we're living in, we are now entering into a new dispensation, I choose that term, dispensation of time, in which this, this symbol is going to be everywhere. Okay. And... I, 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 I would like to be able to give like a two and a half to three hour presentation just on this one symbol. I had a motion picture producer, a rather um, successful motion picture producer, and I were talking about doing a movie. And he, was, and we, and he called it, after I gave him some of the information, uh, he called it, let's call the movie The Symbol. And then we talked about it and said, well, maybe The Hidden Symbol. And I have the contract where he's set me, and here's the movie that we want to do, and we, we'll call it The Symbol, or The Hidden Symbol. And that never got done for all, all kinds of reasons. Um, but then I see the new movie coming out with Dan Brown, The Hidden Symbol, and I'm thinking, these guys who are smart, intelligent in Hollywood, 
they, they are either knowledgeable on this symbol and are releasing it slowly but surely, or or there's some kind of a uh, of a of an understanding going on that people are starting to look at symbols more now and beginning to put the pieces together like I've been doing for 48 years and now they are beginning to perceive what I'm talking about but they haven't got there yet and so it's a form of professional jealousy I would like to be the one that presents my work before Warner Brothers gets a hold of it exactly. from somebody else. Well, I mean, here's your opportunity. So anything you hold back at this point, I mean, really, you do so at your own risk, in a sense. I because understand. Because this is an opportunity, and we are really coming close to the, to the juncture, I mean, 2012 and beyond, right. where this agenda is really coming to the fore. I know. Um, so and it's, it's just it's not, incredible. It's, it, yeah, I mean, it's amazing that you, you've been watching this thing with full... For 40 years, I've been watching it ...awareness right. as to each step, each rollout. Um, and so, take us down the path. Tell all us. the presidents of the United States, all of them, have used the same terms. From George Washington, the terms he used and the things he said were, were taken directly from the ancient prehistoric world of the Anunnaki, the ancient gods, from the ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, Phoenician Canaanites, ancient uh, Greece, ancient Rome, they all use the same word in the same term. Okay, what's the, what is the term? What yeah. are the terms? The term is the dawn of the new day. Okay. And the concept of the dawn of a new day is the, mount, is the sun rising between two mountains. And this goes back to the beginning of Christianity in the 4th century when Constantine codified a, uh, the, the religion called Christianity. Christianity is nothing more than, in my opinion, Christianity is the most popular rendition of the ancient cult story. This ancient thing that for thousands of years has been hidden from people but the masters of, of the world, the kings and rulers have all understood. Christianity is telling you the same story, but you don't see it. So people are fixated on Jesus and on his ministry and never for a moment suspect that the entire story is the same ancient story that's been told by so many ancient cultures and is today part of the new world order Illuminati, Masonic orders around the earth, the entire superstructure of Western civilization has, has bought into this most ancient story, never realizing for a moment what they're doing. Okay, I, I, have, I have some clues along the lines of this, and I have to say, you're really talking about the rise of the sun of Anu, of, of uh, exactly. you know, you're talking about, I don't know if it's Marduk, but it's, 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 it's Orion, the son of Orion. Uh, can you tell now me? Now you're getting close, right? Okay. Right. This is him coming, actually, to, to come back to sit on the throne mm -hmm. and to rule the world. Um, and, and so maybe you can sort of start to paint that picture because um, well, um, now is he coming in a craft? Well, I don't depicted? know. Maybe uh, I, I, I would not be a bit surprised if they're already here, just waiting. Okay. They don't have to come. They're already here. All That's right. what Steven Spielberg said right. in his uh, War of the Worlds. They're not coming. They're already here. That's and right. they popped up from out under the street. What, symbolically, what Hollywood and Steven Spielberg are saying, they're right under your feet. They're right under the Well, city. according to Bob Dean, they're walking the halls of the Pentagon. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Yeah. So we certainly have witness testimony in that area. I'm going to do a presentation on this very soon. <clears throat> I already have a, about a three-hour presentation already ready to go that but I want is, to Okay, but is this it. ruler coming, you know, coming to, 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 to kind of take control? Is this a positive thing in your view or a negative thing? I think negative. Okay. I think very negative. But the whole world is sucking it up. They love it. Never realizing the full implications 
of what's being said. It's like some kids going into Hollywood, you know, leaving home and they're going to Hollywood. They're going to be in the motion picture capital of the world, never realizing, no, no, the streets of Hollywood in this city is not some place for an innocent kid. You're getting yourself involved in something you have no idea in the world how bad it really is. And I think that so many people have bought into the different religious orders, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians, Worldwide Church of God, uh, Mormon Church, all of these are part and parcel of a larger world movement that's been planned for a long time. And where the world, especially in the Western world, I'm talking mostly in the Western world, because the Arabic world is also heavily involved in this, but that's a different subject. But for the moment, Western civilization is just going over the, pref the, the, the going over the wall with this thing. Everybody has bought into it. You're seeing okay, it in politics. About, I mean, it's in the Japanese flag, so there has to be some acquiescence there with China. Oh, yeah, all, absolutely. You know. They're all using it, and they're all buying into this whole new order of the world, never realizing what, it, uh, what this actually implies. You know, the very term, Novas Ordo Cyclorum, on the back of the dollar bill, that comes from the Roman poet Virgil. In ancient Rome, there was a poet that was appointed by the court of Rome to, uh, to write poetry for Caesar. And of course, if you're going to write poetry for Caesar, you want to write something nice that he will like. So Virgil, in one of his poems called Aeneid, Aeneid wrote about the time when there would come a great world ruler in the seat of Caesar, but this ruler would be awesome in power to, to be far more than any man could ever be. And in that time when he would come, the sun would rise on a novas ordo cyclorum, a new world order. And when that one comes, uh, it would be the beginning of a whole new civilization. And the term that Virgil used in Latin was novas Ordo Cyclorum, a new order of the world. Now, when you get into this subject, uh, which I, you know, now you have to get to the, the Hebrew and Jewish uh, religion, where Judaism comes from, where Christianity comes from, where Islam actually comes from, and which trace Jews? back, like, like, uh, like uh, Zachariah Sitchin has done for us, and he's not the only one. There are many who have written on this subject uh, of the ancient world and the symbols and words and terms and theologies that's come down to us for thousands of years. Um, there's just so much we could talk about that without pictures, without the ability to show the audience what I'm talking about, it's a little difficult. But I'm going to be doing a, a, a series on it. I've already okay, got it. Um, but... But basically, we're talking about the beginning of a reign with this uh, king, who is a son. Right. And he's basically going to take control of the world. Of the whole earth. Yeah. And, and, and the destiny of the human family, period. Okay. And do you know where that destiny is headed? In other words, what is unique about this son and, and his proclivities, his point of view? Where's he's, where he's coming from that's different from what we've had before. I think that the biggest, I think that the agenda of this one who is to come is to mutate the human race. I believe that is what is on, on is the agenda, is to mutate the human race, not necessarily um, evolution, Though I believe that evolution has its place in the world. I think that there are things which do evolve. And I'm not talking about man coming from monkeys. I'm not, because obviously man did not come from monkeys. Man is evolving into monkeys. And so that's the problem. But there is a place for evolution. But that's not what I'm talking about. This ancient story coming from the ancient and prehistoric world has dominated all the cultures of the world. What that 
implies, I believe, is there's going to be some kind of a mutation of the human race in order to take the human family on the earth to a new, a new style of life in the universe. And so what will be lost will be your humanity, your, your, uh, uh, your ability to show love and kindness to other people. There will be no room for that. Emotions, uh, there will be no room for emotions. There will be no room for uh, the, the American system of freedom, liberty, and justice for all. That's gone. That's out. There will be no more freedom, liberty, and justice for all. No more family love. No more uh, humanity, you know, man's, man reacting to man. No, all of that's going to be gone. Um, aren't, aren't you also saying, though, that there is a race of humans being actually, that this isn't going to start in the future, that it's already started? Oh, that yeah, it's already the started. The genetic modification of the human actually behind the scenes. Yes. Doesn't you know, in the book that? of Genesis, in the Bible, the Old Testament in Genesis 18, the cha 18th chapter, I did a video on this. It talks about Abraham and uh, Sarah and, um, and the prophet Abraham, and it says that three men, in Genesis 18, go back and read it yourself, says that three men come walking up into the camp. Abraham went out and greeted the three men and, and asked them to stay for dinner, and they said no. They were on their way to other business and did not have time to stop. And it says that Abraham insisted that they stay at least to have something to eat, and then they could go. And they agreed. So they said, all right, make it quick, and we'll stay for something. And so the Bible says in Genesis 18 uh, that Sarah, his wife, fixed dinner for them. They sat under a tree, had dinner with, with Abraham. And then it says, after dinner, two of the men got up and left to go on about their business. But the one that stayed was the absolute creator God, the one who had created the human creature. He sat with, uh, uh, with Abraham having dinner under the tree and then uh, gave prophecies to Abraham and then got up and left. Now, that's in Genesis 18. First of all, my question is, wait a minute. It says there were three men, and the three men came up and had dinner with, with Abraham. And then in Genesis 19, the following chapter, it says that those two men who had gotten up earlier and left were the two angels that went into Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says that when these two angels, or men, went into Sodom and Gomorrah, the homosexuals saw these guys, these two men, and thought that they were absolutely handsome, beautiful, good-looking men, and, and they were attracted to the homosexuals. We'll go read it in gender, Genesis uh, 19. But that tells me if these were, those were the same two men that were with Abraham having dinner, the scripture says they were absolutely handsome, good-looking, handsome men. And God, the creator, is still sitting under the tree with Abraham having dinner. And it says God in, the, uh, in all capital letters. The creator of the human rights is there with Abraham. So I'm just saying that I'm, I'm sure that there are spiritual interpretations of all this, but I think there is a legitimacy about the story that when we read in Genesis where God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, the word in Hebrew, walk with, uh, God walked with Adam, that Hebrew word means uh, you can hear a footstep, stepping on leaves, stepping, you can hear the footsteps. That's what the Hebrew word means. So it, when uh, you know, we poetically say, well, God probably was with Adam and Eve spiritually. No, no, the word in Hebrew says God walked with Adam. You could hear his footsteps on the leaves. All of this implies in the Old Testament that the, whoever created us looked like us. They, and that's why those, the scripture says, God says, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's in Genesis 1. Um, Genesis 1 and 2, both. I talked with, many years ago, I talked with Rabbi Marvin Antoman. Rabbi Marvin Antoman from uh, Massachusetts was a dear friend of mine. 
I think he's still alive today in, in the Knesset in Israel. But he and I used to talk long hours. And, uh, and I asked him once about that scripture, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he said, both Jews and Christians misunderstand that scripture because they, they gloss over it too quickly. Most people think that when they read that scripture that God is saying, come let us make a creature and we will call him man. Well, first of all, you've got to ask, what, who is God talking to himself? He's saying, come let us. Who's us? So he said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. No. He said, no, that's not the way to translate it correctly. He's saying, the, the correct understanding is God is saying to someone, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. Not make man. No, no. Man's already here. But come let us reform, mutate man. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And then later on in Genesis, it says man has now become as one of us. Now he looks like us. So if that is true, then that means today, and I am totally convinced that this is, this is the case, we have entities here from somewhere else, angels, gods, whatever you want to call them, Zechariah Sitchin calls them Anunnaki, but I am totally convinced of my own self that there are alien life forms here who look like humans. And, and yet they're not fully human. And uh, of course in Genesis we're told that uh, this, there's a world of difference. We understand in the book of Genesis a world of difference between an angel and a sons of God. Sons of God are not angels, and angels are not sons of God. Totally different concepts, totally different words. Sons of God are spirit entities, are entities from somewhere who look and have physical bodies and look like humans. They're called sons of God, while angels are spirit entities. So we're told in the Bible, again going back to Genesis, that the sons of God uh, were messing around with women and got them pregnant. Well, i got to figure that these sons of God, their plumbing worked the same way, so therefore they could get women pregnant. And I, can, I cannot imagine a woman being talked into bed by some hideous creature from another world, but I can see it if it's a handsome, good-looking man. Well, that's what the Bible said. They, even the homosexuals said they were beautiful, handsome men. Okay, so... So I'm, uh, the, all of this I'm bringing out as biblical reference for my conclusion that I think Zechariah Sitchin is right. I think other people who have written about the same subject are right, that there are, in fact, entities here, uh, life forms here, that have come here from somewhere else, and maybe they were the originals, and, and, and they are today, in my humble opinion, the people who are running this planet. Okay, it would not surprise me a bit. Are these the Nephilim? I don't know if they, they could be the Nephilim because not all the Nephilim died at the flood. Uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot of Christians will tell you, oh yeah, all the Nephilim died in the flood. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says that there was one of the Nephilim uh, lived through the flood. His name was Og Abasham, O-G. Og Abasham was one of the Nephilim and he lived through the flood and could reproduce and, and reproduce more like himself. We know that there have been skeletons found in, in way down in the earth around the world that are far bigger than we humans are today. Some of them are 16 feet long, some of them are 20 feet long, 12 feet long. So I'm sure that there have been uh, extraterrestrial, for lack of a better term, extraterrestrial life forms who have come here who we look like them. They don't look like us. They created us in their image and likeness. Okay, but this new this new sort of ruler is their son is the son of God, right? He's going to be ruling. In other words, between these two mountains. Um, now I'm wondering what the mountains are symbolized yeah, by. Yeah, very good. <laughs> because the mountains are we talking about? Are we talking about the Soviet Union and and the U.S.? Is are those symbol those the mountains where the sun is going to rise between those two mountains? That's that's. Or are we that's... talking about planets? I think that we're talking about something deeper 
the implications being uh, that in all of the ancient world, there was always a concept in theologies of all the ancient cultures of the world used it, of twin towers, twin things, twin churches, twin towers. That's why that whole thing about the New York twin towers, that is in your face if you understand the symbolism of twin towers in the Roman Empire and the Grecian Empire and Sumeria, Babylonia, especially in Egypt. They always had two obelisks. Yes. They always had the two towers, always. So there is a very powerful significance to the, the concept of twin towers. Very important okay. symbolism. So, so we've got twins and we've got uh, basically Gemini. And how does that work in, are we talking about, I don't know, when, when this so-called God was born? Are we talking about you know, the constellation under which he... Or I, think, I think it will probably be um, when he comes into power, this will be his symbol. His symbol will be the sun rising between the mountains of the east. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin talks about that. Many of the books on the ancient Middle Eastern religions have pictures of Shemesh, the Hebrew god Shemesh, uh, meaning the sun, uh, rising between the, the mountains of the east. That goes all the way back to the cuneiform uh, pictures, you know, on the clay pictures from Sumeria and uh, Babylonia or from Iraq. Pictures of the god rising between two mountains. Um, again, it's, it's very difficult for me to make this intelligent understood because I, I don't have the pictures and it would take me take me about three hours to lay the foundation for this I understand. so I'm just giving you some brief uh, glimpses into what I'm going to be doing soon on okay. this video is, is this ruler are we talking about Marduk or is Marduk already here and this is somebody who's coming after him I'm not sure about that okay but again I would say it all boils down to one thing in my mind that the human race on the earth is being prepared slowly but surely in a scientific method being applied to the human race to mutate the human race, to change us from being what we are today to a creature that the gods have in mind mutating again, because if the Bible is correct, and if Zechariah Sitchin is correct, and all the other writers in, in the, on the subject are correct. This is a real detective story. This is a real detective story here. I'm on the edge of my seat thinking, wow, this is, you know, are we talking about the return of the Anunnaki? Is this connected with the Christian myth of the second coming? Is That's this right. All, is, is that, you know. Really not, this, this particular video is not really for you know, people are just coming to the subject. This is, this actually is for people who have a, a background understanding of all and do is. understand and have possibly <coughs> read Sitchin's work, for example, mm -hmm. and are up to speed with even David and, Icke's work and our work right. and who and may so have been on. following you for many years because in recent interviews, for example, um, on Coast to Coast, for example, you've mm -hmm. hinted heavily that there are things which you're not ready to say yet. Yes. And a lot of people will be watching this, wondering whether this is the time when you've chosen Well, that's true, things. yeah. What we have established here is that there is there's a very predominant symbol, and, and you've talked about how it how it's permeated every aspect Absolutely. Of, of life and religion and Absolutely. that people are not really up to speed on what it really means right. for the human race. And this is uh, sort of a stunning revelation for many people that are listening to this. But I would like to say um, what we are seeing right now is a rollout of an Illuminati agenda that involves population reduction. And what I'm curious is whether or not you can talk about how this agenda to do with the sun coming to the you know the throne of the world if indeed this transpires the the creation of a new race of of humans right and how population reduction folds into that well i think if you're going to have a whole new race of humans uh they are culture that's why we refer to different races of people as cultures and the culture is something under a microscope, you know, it's like a bacteria. 
And so well, that's what we are on the earth. We are a culture. And somebody has actually put us here as a culture and that's watching us grow. And we have become a disease, you know, because we're, we're killing everything in, in, our, in our path. And so I think that whoever it is that has created us had created us, I believe, possibly already knew that in the far future, once this race is finally brought up to speed, and, and then we can move it to the next plateau. And this is what the Nazis were talking about. This is what uh, von, uh, Werner von Braun was talking about. Uh, the Nazis were big on this subject and using the symbol and the term that I, I'm talking about, the symbol between the mountains uh, of the East. England, and interesting about this is England has always had a fixation on Egypt. England's big on Egypt. And go to the British Museum and all these different museums. The English were always big on Egypt. But the Germans were not. The Germans were always big on Iraq. That's what Germany was interested in, Babylon. And the reason why, I think, is because the Nazis and the German people in general, or at least the intelligentsia of the German establishment, realize this story that I'm trying to explain. It has to do with Babylon. It has to do with Iraq. And I believe that may be one of the reasons why the U.S. is in Iraq today. Absolutely. It has something to do with some, and I know it, this is true because I can prove that the symbols which are being used by the U.S. government today in Iraq is exactly the same symbols that I was telling you about that comes from the Anunnaki, from the Phoenician Canaanites, the Syrians, the Phoenician, uh, Phoenicians, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient Britannia, into America, the entire superstructure of civilization has been using the same word and terms and symbol that is today dominating in Iraq. But most people don't even know. They don't even see it. It's hidden in it's, plain sight. Okay, but there is a stargate in Iraq um, that, that's fairly well known that was that Saddam Hussein apparently, they had to get rid of him because he had found it and, and, and was able to to control it while he was in, in, in power. Yeah. So in essence, the U.S. is never, I mean, it's been my, my theory that the U.S. is never going to leave Iraq because basically they have to man that stargate. They have to have control of that stargate, which is where it is said the Anunnaki will return through that stargate. Um, have you heard that theory? Well, yeah, I have, absolutely. And, and my, my, one of my favorite uh, speakers on that subject is William Henry. And William and I have been around the world together and went to Egypt together. We talked a long time about Stargates. Uh, I understand the story. I didn't say anything about Stargates. That's William Henry's work that influenced me in that direction. But I am aware that Hollywood is talking about Stargates. They're making movies about it. And I did a, I did a, uh, a lecture series with uh, Al Bielek and uh, Preston Nichols. I did two uh, weekend seminars in which the three of us spoke together back in Philadelphia. And I, had a lot, I, and I had some time to sit and talk with Preston Nichols. And incidentally, I am highly impressed with Preston Nichols. Okay. You have to be highly impressed with that man when you sit and talk with him. Okay. Because he is a very, very interesting man. He's got a lot of very good information on the kind of thing I'm talking about in private with him. And he was in, enlightening me to some of the things I'm seeing and saying. And so, and, but he's, he's heavily involved in the Montauk story. Absolutely. And the Philadelphia right. experiment being right. the early precursor of that. And then also um, time travel, exactly. which is where Montauk was headed. Um, and then you, you get into the Stargates and right. so on. And this has something to do with letting in, now I'm, I'm, I'm theorizing here, so I want you to help me. But my understanding with the Montauk project was that there were some openings made in not yes. just the timeline, but also in, in space, so to sp speak, where certain races were able to come in through an opening, an open door, basically, that was created by yeah. the Montauk project. And I'm wondering if that has to do with the genetic engineering of our planet such that they were coming in to do a job. 
Well, yeah, I, I think all of that has some validity. I, I don't, I don't know that much about the Stargate itself concept. Uh, I understand it, but I mean that's not my subject. But it plays into my subject. It's, it's part of it, and it must be important because Hollywood's making movies about it all the time, and they actually have television shows Stargate. So I'm sure there's something very legitimate about the concept. All okay. I'm saying is that when I was talking and spent a week, two weekends with Al Bielik and Preston Nichols and myself, I was very impressed with both Al Bielik and Preston Nichols because in my opinion, sitting with them for hours on end and working with them over the weekend, <clears throat> both of them are extremely interesting, provocative people that have just got a lot, and I, I was having fun downloading all this stuff to Preston and he's saying, yeah, well, here's something else you didn't see. Uh -huh. And so I, I have yeah. the highest of that's, regard That's for wonderful to hear, actually, yeah. um, because I, I, I do think there's great validity there and some very important I think um, Preston Nichols is absolutely clues. sensational. I, I love everything I love. He was such, such a, a gracious and uh, such a gracious person. Helpful, kind, courteous, and brilliant. To sit and talk with, so I love I love Preston I hear Nichols. you. Um, now I want. What about Zachariah Sitchin when he talked about the Anunnaki? There was a group of the Anunnaki that went to Mars, that left this planet, and then actually some of which I guess came from wherever the Anunnaki came from, and never actually even made it here. So there's a group that kind of went back to Mars, and then some that came from, according to Sitchin. I'm mm -hmm. just. And so what I'm wondering is, what was going on with Mars? And, and we know that Hoagland has gone down that road quite, quite a distance. But I think that you've given him a, you know, m many of the clues and the basis for his work. And there's something to do with, um, now I, I'm not an expert on this, but I do understand that the positioning of, of, of the, the Great Pyramid and the significance with the right. association with Mars and then, of course, we're talking about Babylon, and Babylon yeah. and Mars are, are symbols for the same thing. Isn't this right? And uh, the whore of Babylon, and, and, right. and there's something going on there. And That's right. Maybe That's what I'm talking about. talk about that a little bit, about Mars and, and the significance with the Anunnaki and where that might be leading? And the very word Cairo, as you probably know, Cairo means Mars. Exactly. That's so another word for Mars is, is Cairo. What is going on with that? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, that is a subject which Richard is probably better uh, suited to talk about than I because I really haven't looked at Mars uh, over and above the, the, the general kind of stuff he talks about. But yeah, I totally believe for myself that Mars is inhabited. And I do believe that there's probably humans like us there. Um, what was his name? Um, uh, quite a long time ago, I had a long conversation in Mesa, Arizona with, um, with um, Virgil Armstrong Postalwaite. Virgil Armstrong and I sat in, in a restaurant in Mesa, Arizona many years ago um, <clears throat> and talked about the people who were on Mars. And Virgil was the guy, from what I gather, was the man who came up with the idea. He was a military CIA operative. And he's the guy that came up with the idea for Green Berets. That was his idea, Green Beret. And uh, he worked with the CIA. And so I, I, I've, I loved sitting and talking with Virgil Armstrong. But he brought out about how, in that conversation, how there were many thousands of people or more like us, humans like us, on Mars at that time. And uh, I what wouldn't year, be a bit what, was year, what year was this that you were talking about? This was to probably 50, uh, that was probably um, uh, 80, mid 80s. Amazing. I yeah. would say 85, 86, 87, something like that. Okay, well, that, that does dovetail also with our experience uh, with our witness, Henry Deacon. Arthur Neumann is, is his real name. He's come out under that name recently yeah. and said he's been to Mars. So I'm wondering if you have any information that's come to you about jump gates, about going between planets? Well, yes and no. Uh, the only thing I have of any value was someone else's work. I sat and talked with him. I sat and talked with him. And he, he is uh, a very, very knowledgeable, very legitimately 
uh, but he worked for the United States Naval Observatory. He was in charge of the Naval Observatory, uh, and he just passed away just recently. Um, but his website is so extraordinary. The stuff he's got, you know, the stuff he has on that website, pictures of of uh, strange things found on Mars, and they're not nebulous things. They're in your face. I mean, uh, those tubes, plexiglass tubes, yes, and uh, and lights in those tubes. Uh, there's just an enormous amount of stuff he has on his website. Well, we have been. Our attention was drawn to that by Henry Deacon as well to those tubes. Uh, which is a fascinating. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, um, I've, what I, you know, I always say I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. What I, if there's any value in my person and my work, it is, I would say this, that I have been privileged to be in the company of extraordinary people doing extraordinary work. And I have been privileged to sit in their company and be accepted by them and be able to learn things um, behind the scenes that other people will never be privy to hear. Isn't it true, though, that you were told that you have a mission that is going to come to the fore late in life yeah. and that you might actually be there now? Do you want to tell that story at all? Yeah, I suppose so. I, I mentioned this, I think, on Coast to Coast once, but it was very quickie because George wants to hear all the stories as long as it's within a minute and a half. <laughs> but uh, we have but, longer than that. Yeah, <laughs> but um, when I was 19, I ended up in Los Angeles at 19 years old with seven bucks in my pocket. Incidentally, I had no idea where I was going, where I was. I ended up in Los Angeles uh, on a Friday night with seven dollars in my pocket. And, uh, you know, a stupid kid, but I lived through it. But later on, a couple of months later, after I got a job and, and things were working out for me, I, I was in North Hollywood one morning, on a weekend morning, and I went into a restaurant, and the, the place was crowded, and there was only one seat available, and that was at the counter. So I sat at the counter, and there was a young girl sitting next to me, so we started talking. Come to find out, she only lived about two blocks from me, and I only lived about two blocks from town. So she had walked downtown, I had also. So we, 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 we started hanging out together. I beat her downtown, we'd hang out together. Now this is back in 59, and I was 19 years old. And so when we would walk home, I lived two blocks closer, so she had two blocks further to go. So I never knew exactly where she lived, but she knew where I lived. One night she came over to my place and said, my dad wants to see you. He wants to talk to you. And of course that put me on alert. I said, I don't want to talk to you, dad. Right? And she said, no, my father is a very important and interesting man. He wants to talk to you. He's got something to tell you. So that sounded interesting. So I went with her. And when we walked up to the house, which was only a couple blocks away, we walked up to the house. Just by chance, he happened to be coming out of the house. And the moment I saw him, I got an incredible feeling came over me of some kind of a, of a euphoric, strange, wonderful feeling that I got being in his presence. It was as if I were in the presence of a, of a, of a great prophet or some spiritual man. I felt it. And I loved the feeling. I mean, I can't describe it, but I loved the feeling. It was an other world feeling. And I noticed that he was very much in control of himself. It, he, he knew exactly what he was doing. So he motioned for us to come in. We went in and we sat, uh, the girls sat on the floor, uh, the fireplace, they sat on the floor. Um, he sat on one end of the sofa, I sat on the other end of the sofa. The, the wife was in the kitchen. <clears throat> I never did see her that whole night. And so we were talking, and he was, you know, just he was asking me how I like living in California, and how your, do you have a job, and how do you, how do you like your job, and just small talk. And I was beginning to feel a little, uh, the apprehension was going away. I was beginning to feel a little bit better at being in his company. 
But I knew there was something about this guy that wasn't right. But I loved the feeling. And I'm 19 years old, so I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I'm just talking to this guy who's dazzling me with his presence of mind and the presence he presented. And so we're talking about all kinds of things. And then when he felt that I was sufficiently at ease, he said to me very nonchalantly, he said, remember when you were eight years old back in Florida and your father built a new back porch and, uh, and your uncle helped him? And remember your dad used green lumber that smelled funny and he built a new back porch? You remember that? And I, th I tears started to come to my eyes. And I did want to show tears in front of my girlfriend, but he was scaring me because he was right. <laughs> and, he, and he knew it. And he said to me, well, did that happen or didn't it? And I said, yes, that happened. And he said, also, one night when you were in bed, you got out of bed and you went out in the back porch. And you were looking at the moon and the moon was full. You remember that? And I said, yes, I remember that. And he said, and you were picking the wood because it smelled funny. It was green lumber, it smelled funny. And you were picking it with your finger. Remember how you picked a piece of it and you were smelling it and, and, and tasting it? And he said, remember doing that? And now I'm really scared because it's frightening to me. And, and, and I said, yes. And he said, well, did you do that or didn't you? I said, yes, I did. And he said, well, how would I know that? How would I know what you did? And I said, I don't know how you know. And he said, I know because we were there. You just didn't see us, but we were there watching you. And I thought, well, and he said, well, because he could tell I, I was not buying. And he said, was I, was I correct in what I said? Yeah, well, how would I know if I wasn't there? And he said, we were there. And I said, who was we? He said, that's not important right now. What's important for you to know is that you're in California because we brought you here. We brought you here to Los Angeles. And I said, you brought me here? He said, yeah, why, why are you here? I said, I don't know why I'm here. I just had to come to Los Angeles. He said, that's right. We brought you here. He said, because what did you say to God? You talked to God that night. The night you sat on the porch, you said something to God. What did you say? And I just sat and looked at him. He said, I'll tell you what you said. You said you, want, you asked God to let you do something important with your life. You wanted to do something of value and importance with your life. And that was about eight or nine years old, right? I said, yes, that's why I said. And he said, well, then we're going to give you an opportunity to do something with your life then. Because you did ask. And I, I'm still amazed listening to him. And he said, what we have for you to do will not happen until the later part of your life. And <clears throat> I'm not going to go into it right now, he said. I'm not going to go into explaining it to you now. However... When the time comes for you to do what we have brought you here to do, you will know what you have to do. By that time, you will be sufficiently knowledgeable on who you are and what you're doing and where you're going. And he said, all you need to know now is that we brought you here and that we will protect you wherever it is that we put you. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, I still don't understand what you're saying. And he said, you don't need to. But one day you will understand. And he said, so I'm here to start you on your journey. He said, I have a book I'm going to give you. And I want you to read the book. And that will begin your journey. And he pulls it off the shelf and gives it to me. And today you can still get that book in bookstores anywhere. It's called The Complete Works of Charles Fort. F-O-R-T. Even in England there's a Fortian society dedicated to the work of Charles Fort fascinating book. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a monumental work. Very thick book. Complete works of Charles Ford. And he opened the book indiscriminately, just put his hand on the page, because a very thick book, and he opens the page and he reads a paragraph. He just opened the page and reads a paragraph. He knew exactly what he was doing. Precisely what he was doing. I didn't know, because it looked like he just indiscriminately opened it. And he read a paragraph that just blew me away. I was knocked out by what he just read. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. 
And he said, oh yeah, the book is filled with that kind of thing. Let me read another one. And he opened it up again and just indiscriminately read something. Not indiscriminately. He knew what he was doing. I'm sure that he knew how to get your particular attention. What would be very interesting to you, I may not even see. But he knew how to play on my emotions. And he, he, he read about three little paragraphs, one after the other. And each one, to me, was absolutely mind-blowing. And I was fascinated with him, with my new girlfriend, and with this book. And then he said to me, he said, you've always been interested in UFOs and otherworldly things, right? And I said, yes, I have. He said, would you like to see some UFOs up close tonight? And I said, I'd love to. He said, well, come on. I can do that for you. And so I got up with him and, and the two girls, my girlfriend and her sister. Now the four of us come out in the yard, it's about maybe midnight in North Hollywood, 1959, and he looks up into the sky and starts inaudibly talking. His mouth is moving as if he's talking to somebody, but nothing you can't hear him. And as I'm watching him standing there talking to the stars, I look over at my girlfriend and she's looking at me. And the look on her face was like, yeah, this is my father, that's him. I told you it was strange, didn't I? <laughs> that kind of thing. And her sister was looking at me and I could tell what she was doing. She was trying to figure out how is this, how is he taking this? How is he, you know, what's going on in my mind? What the little one was thinking? Because she's seen this before. She wants to see how I'm going to re react to this. And so he said, and then he looks at me and he said, they said that they will be coming from uh, Griffith Park in just a minute. There will be three of them. And they'll be coming from Griffith Park area. They're going north. And they said that they'll be here in a minute for you. And I said, who's they? He said, you'll see. And within a couple of minutes, three beautiful disc-shaped things glowing, very faintly glowing, came over with no sound whatsoever in a triangle formation, came over and stopped right above our head and stopped. And when they did, you could see there were disc shape and it looked and appeared like it was like a pie cut in six or eight slices. And each slice was a different color. And what I remember distinctly is each color was like a laser color, vibrant orange, vibrant pink, very vibrant colors, six or eight colors on each one, and they were circulating. Uh, not so fast as to blend the color, but circulating. And they were beautiful, and they were about the size that the full moon appears. So they're not little lights, full moon size, three. And I'm standing there looking at these gorgeous, beautiful, vibrant color things spinning in colors and no sound. And I was absolutely mesmerized. I was just, I was enthralled by seeing this gorgeous, beautiful display. And I looked at him and he's looking at me. And he says, they're pretty, aren't they? And I said, yes, they're beautiful. And then he looks up and talks to me. He said, they're singing, they told me to tell you that they're going now, but they'll see you later. And they did, they started moving and they went out north and afterwards, we went back in, and I said, what did I just see tonight? And he said, that was us. We've been here for a long time. You just didn't know it. And he said, we picked you a long time ago when you were a small child. We have something for you to do. And I said, I, I, I'm not understanding exactly. He said, do, you don't have to. We will let you know what it is you're supposed to do later on in life. <clears throat> he said, but just go on with your life. Don't worry about it. Whatever you're supposed to learn, we'll see to it that you learn. And when it is time for you to do what we have for you to do, you'll know. We'll let you know. And after that, I started, uh, I would go over there on the weekends to visit him and, and the mother and the two girls. <clears throat> and uh, we would go out to the desert sometimes and go way out in the desert and the girls with their mother would go for a walk and he and I would walk in the desert and he would tell me about all the different alien life forms that are out there, where they have come from, the ones that are here. And he told me, you have enemies here. <clears throat> you have some very powerful enemies here from other places that have come 
and they know who you are and they know what you're going to do. So just be careful in your life, but we'll protect you. I don't know what he's talking about. And then one day I went over to the house one morning and the house was totally open and they're gone. They, everything was packed and gone and the girl never told me she was leaving. They never come to tell me anything. They were just gone. Now that I look back on that experience, I feel very secure in saying that he knew what he was doing. He said, I'm starting you on your journey. And he did. And, but after that was done, then he moves on. Do you believe that you're at that place, that juncture where he was talking about you're going to know? Is, has another message come recently, or do you feel that you're right on the cusp of something? I feel I'm on the beginning of something, and I'm still not sure what all of this means. I'm not sure what it means. All I know is that I have some valuable stuff that's going to really knock people out when they see it, but I don't understand it fully yet. And I've talked with Zachariah about it. I've talked with many other uh, speakers and people that are in the speaking circuit that are knowledgeable in the subject. Um, but I, my, my gut feeling, and incidentally gut, G-U-T, is simply God in Scandinavian. You know, God is English, uh, dog spelled backwards. But God in, I think it's Sweden, in Scandinavian countries is spelled G-U-T. So when you say you've got a gut feeling, that's God in Scandinavia. So, but my gut feeling is, is that I don't know the full picture yet. But I'm getting there now. After 48 years, I now know that my 48 years of study, day in and day out, um, researching, reading, staying in libraries, was for a reason, so that when the time would come, I would at least be sufficiently educated in this dark subject, which I'm talking about. At least I've got some background in it now, to be able to understand the significance of it. Um, and I think it's really frightening to me. It actually is, is still rather frightening, because being human, and watching the world where it's going, and I already know the symbols, the words, the terms. I already know the history of the secret societies and the movement, movements of the bankers. I've sat and talked with all kinds of people around the world, with Hakim, my dear friend Hakim, the Kemite priest in Egypt, and we sat out by the pyramids at night and talked about the ancient uh, Kemite priesthood, the, and, and I was blessed in the pyramid. Hakeem blessed me in the king's chamber, laid in the sarcophagus, and, and he did a whole prayer ritual over me. And I've sat, like I said, for hours and talked with him in private about my things that have happened to me. So I am totally convinced that I, I, I there's nothing special about me, but I have been given the opportunity to be in the company of fascinating people to learn monstrously fascinating things. And ultimately, I think that there is something for me to do. I'm just not sure yet what it is. Do you happen to have an idea what race this uh, man was from? Do you have a planet? Do you have any idea? In other words, do you think he was Anunnaki? Do you think he was Nordic? Do you think he was Pleiaran? Do you have any idea? Uh, no, not really. I, because he appeared to be a, an extraordinarily ordinary looking guy. Just an ordinary guy you would meet. But when I was in his presence, it was monstrous, the, the feeling. I knew this is not a normal man. Did his children have a different aura or a different feeling about them? No, mm -hmm. no. No, they seem to be very ordinary. The mother, the, the mother. But didn't you tell me just recently, um, and I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were out in the desert. Yeah. And you had something happen out there. Oh, very yeah. Very recently. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, that, but that's a different, different is, story. Well, is, is it completely different? Is it possible that there was some kind of... Uh, well, no, you're right. You're right. There could very well be some kind of a connection with what happened to me just 
a few years ago, uh, and that original incident back in 1959, yes, uh, very, very possible. Um, that was uh, another extraordinary experience. I've had 36 what I call peak experiences. I mean, monstrous experiences. That was merely one. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> yes, I've had some uh, a very interesting and, and, and emotionally drenching experiences uh, out on the deserts of uh, Nevada. Mm -hmm. One thing I will tell you, which is just my opinion, I am totally convinced for myself that at Area 51, that base we call Area 51, there is no doubt in my mind that there is extraterrestrial life forms there. No doubt in my mind about it at all because of what I have personally seen and experienced when I was at Rachel. I've had too many strange things happen to me that were otherworldly in your face, mm -hmm. like one-on-one. -on -one. And so there's no doubt in my mind that what I experienced out there, we had an alien come in the, in the, in the mobile home. My, Paul, my, my friend Paul Tice and my lady friend from Hawaii, Ivy, all three of us, um, an alien came in the bedroom. So I'm, there's no doubt in my mind, there's something really off the wall going on out there at Area 51 that we are not aware of. But I've had many other world experiences out there, not just, you know, I, I can't stand it when people say that, that this is all high technology of, the, you know, of our government. No, I don't buy that for a minute. What I've seen with my own eyes, I don't buy it for a minute. If it has anything to do with our government, then what, the, what I have actually witnessed with my own eyes, if it is, has, has to do with U.S. government, then that means that the U.S. government is in league with extraterrestrials because what I saw is, is extraterrestrial in origin. So, and what well, I've experienced. Thank you for that. that that's, that's very, very valuable to hear you say that. Can you talk about the possibility that of what these humans that are being created, what their destiny might be? In other words, you say they, they might not have feelings, et cetera, et cetera. And do you feel that perhaps, I mean, this is working in with your um, sort of destiny that they were talking about because these subjects we're talking about right here and now um, I actually went to Egypt with you and William Henry in that group um, I did have a short interview with you at that time you weren't willing to talk about that then I think that now you're much more willing this message that you have is seems to be culminating in this in what you're saying in this symbol that that you know we talked about at the beginning of this of this interview, is it possible that this is going to be the message, the unfolding of what you know? I think, I, I think um, my feeling is that the reason why I'm here doing what I'm doing is because of this mutation which is being foisted on the human race. It's being forced on the human race, this change that the masters of the universe, so to speak, have in mind for the human race is being foisted on us. And I believe, again, just by opinion, that that's what I'm, that's my part in, in this uh, cosmic scheme or this cosmic play is to, is to call people back to their humanity and let them know you're being led down the garden path into something you don't know what's coming you had better get back to your roots of being human and start uh, re-establishing your humanity because the human race is losing its humanity. The way we were designed by uh, the original creators uh, was, a, was a beautiful thing. I mean, when you look at children and, 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 and little animals, you have to know that whoever designed us designed humans and, and life forms to be beautiful, to be charming, to be, uh, to be uh, a, a beautiful thing, to live in a beautiful world with, with children and, and gorgeous and beautiful things which uplift the spirit. But I am totally convinced that there is now on the earth, again for a lack of a better term, 
alien presence, which are the enemies of the human race. And they are obviously enemies of whoever the original creators of us because of the things I've been told. That the people or the entities who created us, the gods who created us, have enemies out there in the universe. And they have come here to see what these gods are doing, what these aliens are doing. And they're coming here and saying, mm, I see what they're doing. They're creating this, these creatures. Um, why don't we move in? Like a gag, why don't we move in and take over and take this beautiful creation that these gods have created and mutate it into what we want. And so to mutate the whole human race away from their natural evolution of, of society and humanity into a whole new kind of civilization. And I think that that's probably what I'm here to do, is to call attention to the world that you're being misled by some extraordinarily powerful, occult, mystical, other world technology that is changing the evolution of the human race from what it was supposed to be at its, at its creation as opposed to where the dark powers of the world are now leading the human race into a different world. And what they have in mind for us, you don't want to know. The okay. people who are in power today in this country and around the world have something in mind that you have no idea in the world how bad it's really going to be. Because there will be no longer any place for freedom, intellectual freedom, spiritual freedom, liberty, justice, none of that. It's gone. Okay, so, but, but you are protected and you've been told this over and over again. And, and this person that you met way back who sort of started you on your journey was also, also part of a race that is, has been visiting here and was, is looking over, you know, out for you in essence, and you've told at least me some personal stories mm -hmm. in which you were protected and there was reasons. You, you were told to leave a room at a certain opportune That's moment right. and so on and so forth. And, um, and I have had that happen to me over and over and over again. Right. So that means there's a force for good. dangerous things happening. And at the moment, I just did not know, walked out and some terrible, dangerous thing happened and I never even heard about it. So this seems to be a force for good, some white hats behind the scene, yes. some of whom have actually talked to you face to face, protected you. Um, one that passed on recently comes to mind. Right. These people who might have been working behind the scenes, even in places that you know made them appear to be working for the, the dark side the, of yeah, the, uh, the, the The establishment. The, yes. But in Point of fact, they were extremely powerful people at very high places. Working for the light. Working for the light. Right. And they told me, you know, we know what you're doing. And, uh, but just, just they, the one of them told me, you have some very powerful friends that you don't even know exist. And uh, they're protecting you. I know. I have seen, I have had the, f I'm not going to get into the details, but I have actually uh, witnessed protection from the highest sources in this country step into something that was very, very serious happening in relation to me. And all of a sudden, it, and I was really frightened because I knew the implications of what's happening and it could be very serious for me. I may not be around much longer. From I've heard from the top. And then all of a sudden I get a communication from Washington, D.C., from the highest office there, saying, don't worry about it, we took care of it. Just go on and don't worry about it. And I was, I was amazed. From Washington, D.C., somebody that high up calls me and says, don't worry about it, just go on about your life, no one's going to bother you. And they didn't. And I've had this happen many, many times when something very serious, uh, very serious threats against my life and against my work. I get a phone call or someone will walk up to me 
in a, in a public place and say, Jordan, that thing that you've been worried about for the last two weeks, yeah, we took care of it. Move on. Don't worry about it. And I thought, well, well, I mean, I'm still here. I'm still alive. <laughs> so I know that I have been protected. I know that. Absolutely. Where would, where would the truth movement be without you? Uh, specifically, Zeitgeist is a movie that was in the top five most viewed on Google Video for like a year at least. Yeah. And I would like the Project Camelot viewers to be apprised of the situation in regards to your involvement with Zeitgeist. Because it seems like management, as I call them, put you in a position in which the whole conspiracy theory movement wouldn't be anywhere near what it is now if it wasn't for your influence. That, uh, yes, um, Zeitgeist uh, is a two-hour movie made by a guy named uh, Peter Joseph in New York. I didn't know anything about it, but Peter Joseph uh, produced a two-hour video, and the last that we heard, um, because on Zeitgeist uh, was one of the first times Google pulled the counter off of something that's on Google Video, usually would have a counter. How many people have seen this video? They sure. pulled the counter. And they pulled it, I think it's somewhere between 20, I think it was at 28 million is when they pulled it. <laughs> and that was like a year and a half ago. And that's based all on your work, isn't oh, it's it? All right? of it. it was based on my work. Yeah. And, and uh, Jeff Rintz had Peter Joseph, which you can go to my website, jordanmaxwell.com, and go to audio video page, audio video, and one of the first entries is a big a, a banner saying Zeitgeist interview, and it's only about five minutes long. But, but uh, Jeff Rentz interviewed Peter Joseph about Zeitgeist and talked about how those, uh, you know, the, they, they pulled the counter a year and a half ago at 28 million, and uh, it's probably more than 50 million now. But he said, why did you make this video? And he said, because the whole thing was Jordan Maxwell's work. I've been listening to him, I've been following his work, and I just decided since he hasn't done anything, I will. So he put, my, he put all of my work together on, on religion, ancient theology, the Federal Reserve, banking, and 9-11 uh, and all that nonsense, and put it all together into a two-hour video called Zeitgeist, which... I am told by people, my friends in Hollywood, and I've lived in Hollywood for 48 years, my friends have said that, you know, uh, if it had 28 million and they pulled it off a year ago, it's uh, probably seen with 50 million. That's a very good showing in Hollywood. You can get 50 million people watching something that represents you. That's, that's pretty heady stuff in Hollywood. Absolutely. I didn't do it. I, I didn't even know anything about it. Yeah. But since then, there have been about six other uh, professionally presented uh, videos done on me that I had no idea. Uh, people will call and tell me, you know, there's an, there's an hour show on you in England. There's an hour show on you in France. Mm -hmm. um, Germany actually came over. A national, the National German Network came over and did an hour program on me. And uh, they had Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. And they, the whole thing was in German. I still have a copy of it. They sent it. <laughs> and it was done in German on me. I understand. Uh, what about, now I don't know if you're willing to talk about this, but Zachariah Sitchin and you sat down and you asked him to tell you a secret based on all your time with him, the things that you had done for him, et cetera, et cetera. You basically said, tell me something that I don't know. Yeah. Are you willing to talk about that? Because no. I think that that is a, is a clue that people would, would really benefit from knowing. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I want to talk about that. Okay. And because when we would, because Zachariah would not like that information? I think it there? is, no, it was, that, it was a private conversation, and, I, and, and when I asked him, um, <clears throat> because, like I said, at one time I was in business with Zachariah. We had, I had a contract with him. And so we were business partners, and so I, I felt a little bit more of a leeway to talk with Zachariah in private. And so I asked him one time um, some per very personal questions about his work, and it was 
absolutely mind-blowing and staggering, the, the things he was telling me. And then, uh, well, anyway, then he told me some things about myself. And I was, uh, I was amazed. I never heard such a thing, you know, that what he was being told or, or wherever he got it from, he had a view on me, who I am and what I'm doing. But at that time we were talking, it was, uh, it was a private conversation. And I, okay. I think it'd be better just left private. Okay, fine. All I would say is this. Zachariah Sitchin is a fascinating man and a, a brilliant uh, writer, and I love everything he's doing, and I love the man. He's a very dear friend, and I, and I, I love Zachariah Sitchin. He's a very, very gentleman kind of guy, and so I like that. Okay. Um, would you classify what you've been talking about, in a sense, as a war that, that is going on on a spiritual yes, level no doubt for about the hearts it. and minds of humanity? Yes. Absolutely. There is a spiritual war going on right now. And Hollywood's making movies about it. Uh, war of the Worlds, Steven Spielberg. I've said, so, I've said so many times that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas are many things, but stupid is not one of them. Steven Spielberg is trying to tell you something. He, in a, one of his interviews a few years back, I remember... Um, he said that he does not, Steven Spielberg said, I don't make movies to entertain necessarily. I make movies to comment on important issues of the day. And looking at Spielberg's work, which is genius, uh, something I want to say about Spielberg. I've watched a lot of productions, and I've been in Hollywood for a long time, 48 years, I've lived in the North Hollywood and Hollywood, and I have many, many, many friends in the industry, and I already know, because I've been told that virtually all the major names in Hollywood know who I am, and what I'm, they should, I've been talking for 48 years, <laughs> and they're using all my stuff now, so they should know me, but Steven Spielberg is one of the most clever people I have ever watched a person's work because he puts a, a couple of things. One is he's a stickler for um, accuracy on costumes and, and the terms that are used. So anytime you see anything that Spielberg has made, it's very accurate. The clothing that would have been worn in those days, the way that people would have talked, it's very accurately done. So he's a stickler for accuracy. But the thing I really appreciate, appreciate about Steven Spielberg is he puts little things, little small things that you would never see if you're not looking for it, that are really a mind blower. And that, wow, back that up and that one scene with that one person's, what they said, uh, He's a master at doing that. He's a master at putting powerful things in a, some little insignificant scene. So if you're not watching, you never get to see the real genius of Steven Spielberg. I love watching his movies because I know what I'm looking for. So and he's using symbolism oh, yeah. all over his movies. Everywhere. Yeah. And George Lucas... Same uh, equal. Yeah. George Lucas is brilliant, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, he was he was heavily. Uh, he even said he was heavily uh, influenced by uh, Joseph Campbell, the 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 the, yes. uh, the uh, famous. And Joseph Campbell was an incredibly dear man. I just love listening to Joseph Campbell explain mythologies and all the symbols of the ancient people. Did you know him? No, I never had a chance to meet Joseph Campbell. What about Arthur C. Clarke? Did you? Ever no, I never had a chance to meet Arthur C. Clarke either, but I would love to have. I've had opportunities to be in the company of people like that, but I was not in a position to travel. I didn't have the money. I was in a de depressed state of mind, and so I let some very important people go by that I could have been with. I used to be on the board of directors 
of an organization in Hollywood, <clears throat> this was quite a few years ago, called U.S. of A. <clears throat> U.S. of A was United Sensitives of America. This organization was founded uh, in Burbank, and I came in at a very early period, and I ended up being on the board of directors of U.S. of A. Um, I really didn't take a whole lot of, uh, of charge in it. The, the man who started it pretty much ran it. But in words, I was on the board of directors. But anyway, it was an organization where uh, numerologists, uh, uh, astrologers, um, all kinds of esoteric disciplines would come together. And uh, we would put on shows, expos, and also once a year we would put on an award show where we would honor certain movie stars for their work in feeding the poor or, or whatever. But Usually weren't about you also two. involved in, 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 in maybe discovering uh, murder suspects? Oh, yeah. And we also would, like every two weeks, occult yes. happenings. Every that, two that weeks, going on. I think it was like every two weeks, we would, be, we would meet uh, about uh, 9 o'clock in the evening up in the Hollywood Hills from the Hollywood side. And we would be up there, and there'd be about 50 people up there in this big, huge home that was owned by a movie star who had passed away. And uh, it was a huge, big home. And then the front room was just enormous in size. And there would be like 50 people there every two weeks. And there would be a group of ast astrologers, group of uh, psychics, group of numerologists, group of this group and that group. And they were all diff diff different disciplines in the esoteric sciences. And we would have the police department or the sheriff department, uh, usually it was LAPD, would come up, sheriff a couple of times too, and they would come up and we had a big blackboard and, and they would have pictures up on the wall of the case that they wanted us to talk about. And they would show us the person who was kidnapped or the body that was found or whatever the case was. And then they, uh, the, the officer in charge, usually a detective, would write down, or I have it already written down, all the pertinent information that the police department had. So that all the, and all, each group sat with a group. I mean, all the astrologers sat together. I do want to ask you, which group were you among? Were you a psychic? No, I was with the, the people who were putting it on. I, the, 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 it was all being sponsored by the US of A, United Sensitives of America. <clears throat> Since I was on uh, the board, I was there representing the company that's putting this thing together. And um, we would also do, uh, like I said, we also would have um, um, award ceremonies once a year in which we would give awards to different people who are doing different hum things in, for humanity. I was privileged to be able to be there to give Manly Palmer Hall an award for his work uh, <clears throat> in service to the world. Manly Palmer Hall, I believe, was one of the finest and most dearest men I have ever met in my life. He was not only charming and extraordinarily brilliant mind, but he was one of the most decent and beautiful people that I have ever personally ever met. Manly Palmer Hall was an was a extraordinary teacher. He never promoted anything. He merely educated people as this is where this came from, this is where that came from, this is what that word means. So he was an educator. People have, have called him all kinds of names because he was a Mason. I knew him personally. I've been to his home. When he died, he left me a, a beautiful gift. All of his research journals he left to me. That's amazing. I was, I was shocked when I got a phone call from Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles <clears throat> and um, Obadiah Harris, the president at that time, said, Mr. Hall wanted you to have something when he passed away. And I said, what is it? And I was in San Diego and he said, I'm not going to tell you, just come pick it up. So I drove up that day 
to uh, Los Angeles from San Diego. <clears throat> and it was all of the research journals of Manly Palmer Hall he gave to me. And I consider that to be a monumental gift from a very powerful man. <clears throat> Did you find some clues there to uh, oh, follow yeah. out? <laughs> Tons of stuff there. Okay. Uh, Manly Palmer Hall, as I said, was a, one of the greatest teachers the world has ever known. In my humble opinion, I don't think there's ever been in any era of time a man to come close to what Manly Palmer Hall was able to have do. Anyone who has an open mind, and of course your mind is like a parachute, it doesn't work if it's not open. Anyone who is intellectually honest, which you don't find very much, intellectually honest with an open mind, <clears throat> mature and intelligent person looking at the work of Manly Palmer Hall would have to say this is one of the greatest men that ever lived. I don't know how many, maybe 70 or 80 books on esoteric subjects of the whole world. Um, over 46 sets of lectures, like six 90-minute audio lectures on 46 esoteric subjects of the world. Wonderful. Incredible, plus thousands of lectures. Incidentally, I have everything he ever did. Every lecture he ever did, I have digitized. Mm -hmm. Monumental work. But he was a personal friend of mine, and I loved him dearly. And, I, and I, I'm saying this because there are so many people who put him down because he was a Mason. He was a wonderful teacher, a brilliant man, to which his detractors could not even hold a candle. I so. Hear how do you feel? I'm just to, to and he's change not the gears. only one. I have other people I feel the same way about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do you, how do you feel? Um, just to change gears here a little bit about the current administration of Obama. Well, I'm not political as such. Uh, personally, I think I would choose my words carefully here, because I like Obama as a person. And he's very personable. He's the kind of guy I would love to sit and chat with, and and uh, and his children are beautiful. His wife is very intelligent young lady, and so I don't have anything against Obama or his family. I think they're very personable and very interesting people. Uh, but it's the powers behind him that he represents that's frightening to me. I know things about the people who are behind him that is absolutely staggering, frightening. I, I, am, I live in fear of what's coming because, uh, because of what I know, not because of what I believe or think, because of what I know. Are you talking about war? Uh, are you talking about an agenda that involves uh, war, World War III? <clears throat> well, that's, that's always possible. Let me go back and say this. Um, again, I, I, I have nothing against Obama as a person, and I like him. Uh, the family, I have nothing against him at all. But um, the symbol that I've been I was telling you about, that I've been working on, uh, did you ever see the movie, uh, the television show, a V? Oh, absolutely. The very first one? Yeah. Well, the ABC is now remaking V. They're remaking it. And I was shocked. Someone sent me an email. I think they were in Hollywood. And they sent me an email with a picture from the new movie coming out soon. I think it's going to come out in the next month or so. Uh, um, a made-for-television movie by ABC. Really? Okay, fabulous. Disney ABC. Very interesting. Okay, okay yes. And it's going to be called V. Mm -hmm. And it's a remake of the original. Okay. But in it, the extraterrestrials who are referred to as the visitors, the visitors in the new one are giving to the public a pamphlet explaining their, quote, new world order. 
that they are bringing to the planet. Right. And the picture which I have shocked me. My knees got weak and I had to sit down. It was shocking. There was the, the visitors, the alien visitors who looked like humans, were handing out pamphlets to the people about their new order that they were going to bring in. And the title of the pamphlet was The Dawn of a New Day. The very words that I have been researching for some 40 years is now going to be in the movie uh, of the new V. Okay. And I'm telling you, that is not only significant, it's mind-blowing when I give you the whole story. <laughs> ABC and Disney are telling you something about this symbol that I've been looking at for a long time and it's going to be right in your face because I'm telling you that symbol is going to become the most important symbol around the globe for the first time in the public view. Anytime you want to do research on the hidden stuff like I've done, it's everywhere. But no, now because of Obama, now the secret societies of the what I think are extraterrestrial masters of this world are going to bring this symbol out into the world so everyone can see it. And eventually what, uh, what's going to happen is that the whole human race is going to wake up, and this is what my opinion about 2012, my opinion of 2012 is going to be an awakening for the whole world we've been had. They're going to see this as an ancient thing that's been coming for a long time, and we never, we never saw it, we didn't understand it, but when my video comes out that I want to do, it's going to be like a three-hour step-by-step on Obama's symbol, Jimmy Carter, all the presidents, the Bushes, the entire superstructure of Western civilization and what this stuff really means and where it really comes from, I think, and I'm not, I'm not, be, I'm not trying to aggrandize myself, but I really believe that it's going to cause quite a sensation when people see what I really have that I've never told anyone before because it's and, and when I see Obama using the same terms the same symbol the same one that the communists use the Nazis have used the fascists have used the secret societies around the world of Freemasonry have used the Babylonians, as I said, all the ancient Egyptians, they all use the same word, term, and symbol. And now ABC is coming out, Disney ABC is coming out with a new remake of V, and in it the extraterrestrials that look like humans who are bringing a, quote, new order to the world, and the pamphlet in the movie is called Dawn of a New Day. I always said, wow. I cannot believe how overwhelmingly obvious this secret symbol is now becoming. And but that's why told, I want to do this video on it. But were you told more about the movie, more about, you know, where they're going with it? In other words, I'm assuming you haven't seen it. But no, no, I haven't seen it yet. But I, I, I watched the other one so many times. And the other ones, uh, if you remember in the original, The Visitors, they were wonderful people, they were, they were very gracious and, and charming. And then remember the lady who was in charge of the visitors, she was the highest ranking. She went into a room and pulled off her face and it was a reptile alien. Yes. I personally, I brought David Icke to America. He was in America because I brought him here personally. Yes. And so I'm saying that I am totally convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt for myself that there are such things as reptile aliens. Though I have never seen one, thank God, but I totally believe they are here. Not because of David Icke, not because of Krito Mutwa, who I love listening to, a wonderful, fascinating man. David Icke has done great stuff. But I believe uh, extra, there are reptile alien aliens here because of my own personal research. 
I have been in the company of at least eight people over my over the past many years, eight different people, each one is extraordinarily well grounded people. Airline pilot one, uh, with a major airline, uh, a very wealthy man in Las Vegas who buys and sells commercial hotels, buildings, etc. Extremely wealthy man, uh, Christian, incidentally. Very Christian man, but very, very wealthy and very highly intelligent man, sat down and told me about his personal one-on-one -on -one with a reptile alien in which many others in his church were privy to see. That's a whole story in itself. That happened in, in Colorado. Uh, and then to have a scientist um, and, and, a, and a young lady who was one of my favorite people in the world, a young lady called Nancy, who just blew me away and on my radio show. I used to have a show. I've had seven different radio shows in my life. I'd like to get back on radio and do my own show again. But I had a show on KPFK uh, here in Los Angeles, FM station. And one night I had uh, a Nancy on. And Nancy just blew the audience away. She is so feminine. So incredibly charming and feminine girl talking about stuff that will blow your mind. <laughs> Her father was uh, in the Air Force, uh, a family with Air Force, but her father was in charge of project retrievables for the Air Force. The man who was in charge of going out wherever in the world that any extraterrestrial activity, he was in charge in the Air Force to go there first. And he was the boss. And she said, and, and, the, and the modus operandi was always the same. And, and, and I'll have to make you a copy of her. Two, I got two two-hour interviews that will just knock it. you out. Um, and you could tell this is a very charming girl, but telling you stuff that you're going to have to sit down to deal with. <laughs> and she said her father, wherever they would go, she always lived on military bases. And she said, and always the method was the same. There was one phone in the house for the family, and then there was another phone which no one ever touched. You never used it. And when that phone would ring, no matter when, two in the morning, three in the morning, it doesn't matter. If that phone rang, her father had 10 minutes to be fully dressed with his briefcase and ready to go. And in 10 minutes, a car would pull up, and nothing was said. No voices, no nothing was set. A knock on the door, he would walk out, he would have military escort him to the car, get in the car and drive off, and that's it. Nobody knows where he's gone, and nobody needs to know. And so she said, in many a night, they would get that phone ring, he would get up, dressed, briefcase, ready to go, and they would take him somewhere in the world where something has just happened in the Air Force was sending him to see what, what, had, what just happened, and they're in charge. And she would tell me the things that her father, and especially her mother, she said the father would never, tell, would never tell her anything when she was a child, but the mother you know, would tell her later on in life. She told me an experience that just blew my mind about a reptile alien, and you really have to hear it from her. But she basically the story, and it's so fascinating. I got to tell you, she said, she said her father would never allow her to be left alone in the house ever. When he would go off during the day, they live on base. They live on base. Doesn't matter. When he would leave the house, immediately uh, military would come and guard all four corners of the property. They would sit there in car uh, in cars and guard while he's gone anywhere. Uh, if he went to the market or whatever, they would be guarding the house. <clears throat> and he would never allow her to stay at home by herself. And so she said one night, and you'll hear this interview, she said one night, it wasn't on base, they were here in Los Angeles somewhere, <clears throat> and she said that uh, her mom and dad were going next door to a, uh, to a party next door, and she asked her dad if she could stay, stay and she was like 13, 14 years old, and he said, no, absolutely not. So she talked to her mother, and the mother talked to the father and got him to agree to, that she could stay home. 
And so she said, so for the first time in her life, she was actually going to be alone in the house by herself. And she said, so she was in a bedroom. She said, combing her hair, and she had a mirror that she could see her closet. And the closet had French doors. And she said they were closed, partially closed, and it wasn't too uh, well lit in the, in the room. She said she was combing her hair, looking at the closet door, and all of a sudden the closet door opened up, and a reptile alien stepped out. And she said he had to bend down to get under the header, and he stood up. She said it was a full-grown man, extremely muscular, but it was a reptile body, reptile alien head. And she said, this thing looked at me, and I'm looking at it in the mirror. And she said, he started moving toward me without moving his legs. He was just floating toward her slowly. And she said, I felt like it was like coming up on a fly. He was, you know, grabbing quick. And she said she jumped up and screamed and ran down the hallway, ran into the bathroom, locked the door, opened the window, and started screaming. Of course, everybody in the neighborhood heard, she said, and when I heard, and he, this reptile alien, she said, came down the hallway, and I could feel that, uh, him walking because he was so heavy. And he was scraping on the door, growling like a dinosaur growl, scraping on the door. <clears throat> And she said, then when our father and, and the neighbors come running up, they open the door. When they come running up, they were yelling outside. This reptile alien ran back down the hallway into our bedroom and disappeared. She said, when our father came in, the, the, the bathroom door was just ripped. And obviously, the father said he was not going to hurt her. But it was a message, and he said, that's why I never wanted her to stay alone, because these aliens have told us, the Air Force, that you keep poking your nose into our business. Every time something happens, you come out and poke your nose. So we just want you to know, the next time something happens, and you poke your nose into our business, while you're out here poking your nose into our business, some of us are going to come visit your daughter. So you, you need to stay home and stay out of our business. And so he said, so that's why they always had military around any time he left. And so when she was telling me this story about other reptile aliens, and of course I've heard it from so many legitimately important people, uh, I have to believe that there is something to this story. I have personally not seen one, but I don't want to. <laughs> but I've seen enough to know that there are life forms on this earth which are not from here. I've already seen too much to know that. Um, my experiences have been extraordinary, as I said. 36 major experiences I've had in my life where I've dealt with other world uh, phenomena. So, I okay, don't know. Okay, well, this is, this is a really amazing interview. Um, can you talk at all about anything else that you think that people should know in terms of the overall picture that you've been giving them here? I, um, would, say, I would say be aware that there is a war for your soul. There is a war for the spiritual. You know, there's always been this question for thousands of years. All the great philosophers ask it about whether we are physical bodies which have a spirit in it, or are we originally a spirit which has taken on a physical body? You know, I mean, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, but I am, I am convinced that uh, no matter how it happens, if we were physical and took on a spirit, I, or maybe we were a spirit and took on a physical body, I believe that there is a war going on from somebody out there that was an original enemy of whoever created us. So whoever created us has enemies out there in the universe uh, that are diabolical enemies. And we know this is, is true in government. You know, you, you may see the president and the, and the first lady and all of that, and it's very prom and proper, but they have enemies, powerful enemies. That's why they have to be totally surrounded by military and protection, because they have serious enemies. Something happened to me that tells me that there's something going on like that. 
I was in Hawaii many years ago with my wife and some friends. We went to Hawaii for the first time. And I was sitting in a restaurant across the street from the Hilton Village. And in the restaurant, which is a main drag, a main strip, and uh, I was sitting with my back to the door. And someone came in, and I immediately had an electrical charge go through my body. It's bad enough being shocked by, a, by a, the wall plug, but if you don't know it's coming, it's even worse. And I was sitting at the table talking, and all of a sudden, somebody came in, and an electrical shock went through me, and I knocked the stuff on the table. I knocked water and stuff on, on the table, and I jumped up, and I, 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 involuntarily, I just jumped up, and something told me, run quick, you're in trouble, you're going to die, run quick. And I ran out the back door of the restaurant, ran across the restaurant, left my wife and my friends, and ran across the, 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 the restaurant, ran out the back door, and the voice said, run quick, you're in trouble. Go across the street to the hotel. And I screamed, and I remember yelling, I can't go across the street. It's a main, you know, there's, there's traffic out there. And it said, run, there will be no traffic, run. And so I ran out into the street involuntarily. I wasn't even, I was not making a conscious decision to do any of this. It was being foisted on me. And I ran across the street, and as it so happened, there was no traffic for that little stretch. I ran out, and it said, go out around the hotel. The voice would say, run quick to the hotel. And I ran around the hotel, and it said, all right, you're safe now. Now you're safe. And I sat down. My heart was pounding. And I kept thinking, what did I just do? And how am I going to explain this to my wife and my friends, what I just did involuntarily? I don't know what happened. That happened to me twice. The second time was a few months later in Los Angeles. I was on the corner of Fairfax and Wilshire Boulevard in a little coffee shop called Johnny's uh, Hamburger Stand. It's a little restaurant. I was sitting at the counter, and I noticed peripheral vision. I didn't look over to see them, but peripheral vision, I saw two guys walk in. And as I walked in, immediately an electrical shock hit me. I almost fell out. I was at the counter. And the voice said, get out quick, you're in trouble, run. And so I grabbed a bunch of money, threw it on the counter, and tripped, trying to get out of the, out of the chair on the, on the counter. I got up, and I hit the side door, and I ran north on Fairfax. And the voice kept saying, run, your life is in danger, run quick. And I ran about two or three blocks until I was just about out of breath. And then the voice said, all right, you're safe now. You're safe now. Sit down. And I sat down. My heart was pounding again. And it was involuntary. I didn't make a conscious choice to run. I just, I just started running. And the voice was talking, was yelling to me. It was actually like a yell. Move quick. Your life is in danger. So it happened twice to me. I have no idea what that all means. It just, I'm just telling you what happened. Okay, so, so you are, are positing the fact that there is a symbol, that in the symbol is basically um, uh, telling the world of a new world order and, and the return or the, 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 basically uh, a son taking control yeah. and that this is happening sometime in the near future. Yeah. And I'm assuming you think around 2012, is that correct? Yeah, that's what I think. Okay, and then you're talking also about um, really reptilians and, and an agenda, which yeah. is not quite clear, but there's something going on with that's that. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm now asking you is whether or not that so-called king is reptilian. Well, I don't know. And what I would say to an audience that's watching this, <clears throat> I've said it too many times before, but I think it bears saying again. I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I'm just telling you what I have seen with my own eyes, what, what has happened to me in my life, but I would also say to anyone who would scoff at this, just look at what I have to offer first before you make a decision if I'm crazy or not. See what I have amassed in the past 40 years that I haven't told you, that, that you don't know that I have. 
and see the, the, the research that I have done on this subject of this new order of the world, which I started talking about back in 1960. I was sending uh, letters to uh, Bo Belmont, uh, Massachusetts, back in 1960, Belmont, Massachusetts, I was sending letters to the John Birch Society, who had just been formed in 1959. And the John Birch Society was, of course, exposing all the communist uh, activity in the world, especially in America. I was already well into all of that in 59 when they started. And so I started sending them articles that I, uh, things like, well, you need to look at this symbol and this word and this term here. And also you might want to look at this, this guy and this organization. So I was sending them little tidbits of information back in 1960 on the subject of Illuminati, on, on secret societies, not Illuminati. Because Illuminati I found out about, like I said, in 1967 when Anthony Hilder produced uh, the series of records, of three 33 and a third record albums called Illuminati. The man speaking was an incredibly interesting uh, man named Myron Fagan. And I don't know if you've ever heard Myron Fagan's Illuminati record. It will knock you out. Absolutely. Today, it's still a knockout. Wow. And when I hear it today, I heard it 40 years ago. When I hear it today, it's still a mind blower. Um, I have a question for you that is a little bit moving on a, onto another topic. It has to do with the Illuminati, but I wonder if you would address it. What is the significance of merging the red and the black? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, it's called red and black and white, all three, red, black, and white, are referred to in Hollywood as death head colors because death head comes from a Nazi... Uh, organization called the SS and the Gestapo. Gestapo was referred to as the Order of the Death Head. And the Order of the Death Head, Gestapo in Nazi Germany, symbol was the uh, skull and crossbones, skull and bones. That was their symbol. But to the Germans on the, on the inside, the Gestapo was known, was called the Order of Death Head. And Death Head's Colors in Hollywood. I attended a lecture uh, many years ago by a black doctor <clears throat> who worked at Martin Luther King Hospital. And some of my uh, friends in the, in the motion picture industry, black entertainers, called me and said, you really need to be here tonight. You need to come and hear this. It's, a, it's a, gonna be a private uh, lecture by uh, a doctor from Chicago who came out here, was, was an actual doctor working at Martin Luther King Hospital, and he was giving a lecture on death head colors. And in it, it was, it was fascinating. Uh, it was a slide presentation at a library, in Santa Monica Library, in a private invitation only. There's only about 25 to 30 people there. And he was explaining the death head colors, why it's black, white, and red and how black, white, and red are used in motion pictures. When someone is going to die or something, someone's going to be killed, those are the three prominent colors that will always be in those scenes. They're called death head colors. They symbolize the darkness of the darkest, uh, the, the most profound presence of evil, red, white, and black. But there's also a significance in terms of the occult with regard to certain genetics? Certain genetics? genetics. Oh, of course, of course. In other words, uh, the red being a, you know, a red-headed person yeah. with certain kinds of, of, of DNA. Oh, I'm sure. I'm and, sure there is and, more and to that. And the black being uh, a, a, a blonde, uh, usually Celtics, a mixture perhaps. I'm sure those. that there is that too, yeah. Uh -huh. it was, the only thing I was saying is that that was very interesting because I remember that night he talked about uh, the, the uh, European Masonic orders and how the Mexican gangs in Los Angeles and around the country use Masonic symbols from a particular Masonic order in Europe, while the black gangs use an opposing symbols and terms and symbols 
of a different Masonic order in Europe. And, they, and that most likely the, the, the gang members themselves do not realize that these are actually can be traced back to Masonic symbols in Europe. And, and so I believe that the gangs going on in America today are being organized, directed, and financed out of Europe to destroy our culture in America. I think that European Freemasonry is in, heavily involved in destroying America. And you need to understand the whole story about how America was founded and how it was, a, it was founded as a corporation. It's a privately owned corporation. We can you know, talk about that for days on end. Um, and this is just my opinion, one man's opinion. But I'm going to give you my opinion as to the bottom line on the world today and the stuff that's going on on the earth today uh, what we call Illuminati was a, originally uh, a term which is given to us uh, in Spain to um, a religious order in Spain that later on were amalgamated into what we call Jesuits. So the Jesuits are truly Illuminati themselves. Um, and the Vatican, and, and you go well, into that. Well, that was what I was going well. to say, yes. I believe that one of the most evil organizations that exist on the earth today. And you'd have to have spent all the years with me in libraries and research societies and traveling around the world and talking to other writers, authors, lecturers, and teachers and collecting this stuff over a period of 45 to 48 years to understand what I'm telling you. But I believe today the most serious evil organization on the face of the earth is the Vatican. That's my personal opinion. I think if, if the Vatican was done away with off the face of the earth, there would be a shout of liberation heard around the world. <clears throat> because the Vatican, in my opinion, is the, is the bulwark of this dark thing that's happening on the earth. So when you talk about Illuminati, when you talk about the really dark criminal stuff that's going on on the earth, you're talking the Vatican. You're talking the Knights of Malta, which gave us the six men who founded the CIA in America were all Catholics, members of the Knights of Malta. When you begin to look at the banking fraternities in America, like the Bank of America, Union Bank in California, all of these people who founded these banks and today are running the banking establishment are all Knights of Malta, Catholic masonry. So when I hear people talking about the Jews this, the Jews that, and the Jews are responding, I said, no, no, you better go back and do your homework. The Jews have been slaughtered all over, all over Europe by the Vatican. You need to remember that for at least 2,300 years, Rome has dominated Europe. Under the Caesars of Rome and in the 4th century, late 4th century, the Vatican comes into, into being. And the Vatican dominates all of Europe, all the heads of state, all the princes and kings and rulers, all the kings and rulers in Europe rule by the divine right. It's called the divine right of kings. What are you talking about? Who represents divine to give the king the right? The Pope. The Pope appoints certain families to be over the French. The Pope appoints certain people to be over the Germans and over the British. And so by divine right. Why? Because the Pope represents God. And the Pope says that this family is holy and that they should rule. And therefore, they could now say they rule by divine right. And the whole idea of divine goes back to the chalice, you know, and the, the Holy Grail. And in the Catholic Mass, you have the, the priest breaking the bread and then pouring the wine. Well, wine is made from grapes, and wine is red. So it's a red grape wine represents the blood of, of the atonement blood. It's a blood sacrifice. But where does the blood, I mean, where does the wine come from? It comes from grapes, and grapes grow on divine. And that's where we get the concept and the word divine, because it comes from, grapes come from divine. So that's where we get the word divine. 
And once you begin to realize how the Vatican has for over 2,300 years, Rome has dominated Europe, and in 1,600 years, the Vatican has dominated Europe, and Europe for 2,300 years has dominated the earth. So if you want to talk about conspiracies and you want to talk about evil, don't talk about Jews. You better talk about the people who would control Europe for over 2,300 years, Caesar of Rome, the Roman Catholic establishment. There's the real story. Now you're getting into mafiosi. Now you're getting into the fraternal orders of Freemasonry out of Europe, Knights of Malta. Now you're getting into the organized crime, Sicily, Corsica, Corsica, and all of the profound drug running, white slavery, murder for hire, Vatican. I mean, even, uh, what was his name, the producer of Godfather, um, what was his name, uh, Francis Ford Copeland. Mm -hmm. And Godfather Three, Francis Ford Copeland and Godfather Three, the third one in the series, opens up with Michael Corleone being anointed by the Cardinal in New York to be a member of the Knights of Malta in the Catholic Church in New York. What is he telling you? The connection between the Vatican, the Holy Father, there's nothing holy about the Holy Father. There's nothing holy in Israel, nothing. There's nothing holy in the Vatican. There is nothing holy in Salt Lake City. There is nothing holy in religion, period. It's a way that the masters, whoever these entities are who are controlling the human race, they have set up certain institutions of learning, of education, religion, and government. That's why I've said you better go back and do your homework on where the history of the world comes from. I don't see the world being run by Jews. I see Jews being used, but you will find that even Rothschild, the, the, uh, the, the Rothschild family who we hear so much about, those Jews who were running Europe. No, if you go back and look at the history of the Rothschilds, you will find that Rothschild represented the Vatican. He was dealing for the Vatican. He was a Vatican banker appointed by the Vatican to deal for them so that the Catholic Church would never be involved in all that terrible stuff going on in banking, we'll let the Jew do it. Then, of course, if, if something comes out, well, it's Jewish, obviously. No, no, it's your money that he was handling. So if you really want to nail down the real enemy to America and, and to the earth, I'm telling you, it's only taken me 48 years to get here. I was born and raised Catholic. I mean, I, 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 my whole family were very Catholic in town. We were the most Catholic family in town. But I know history. And I know that the most criminal organization on the face of the earth, in my humble opinion, I, I, I don't know that much about it, I've just, I've just been looking at it for 48 years, is the Vatican. As far as I'm concerned, it's you. the worst thing that's ever happened to the world, is what's really going on in the Vatican. And that doesn't even bring up the subject of propaganda doing. P2, the propaganda do it, P2 Lodge, that was even mentioned in Godfather 3 twice. There's a Masonic order in, in Europe called Propaganda Due. It's called P2. And it is the, it's connected directly, P2 is connected directly through membership with Opus Dei and the Knights of Malta and the Jesuits. Jesuits, Opus Dei, Knights of Malta, Masonic order, are connected directly to something called Propaganda Due, P2 Lodge of Freemasonry. P2 Lodge of Freemasonry is world famous to people who do research into criminal organizations. And P2 is, is pure, unadulterated, pouring directly out of the trough, Nazism. Underworld organizations, drugs, humans, uh, human trafficking, pornography, violence, underworld organization, it's all P2. They are the ones who are promoting the, uh, the uh, right-wing death squads in Central and South America, Mexico, the drug cartels in Colombia, we're talking Catholic, 
Knights of Malta, drug cartels, Colombia, um, extraordinary vice on a, on, a, on a level which it is hard for most humans to, to recognize, and it's all being orchestrated out of the Holy Father in Rome. This is why I've said so many times, there's never going to be a time in the history of this country that America will be saved. I don't believe America can be saved. I truly do not believe that America or the human race, I don't think there's, that I'm just, it's just my opinion again, but I don't think the human race can be saved, and I don't think America can be saved, because so many millions of people just love the filth and degeneracy of the world we live in. They love it. They love the Holy Father and all the pomp and glory of, the, of all the politicians and kings and rulers and, and, and the, the pusillanimous pictures of Bush you know, kissing the ring of the Holy, pa Holy Father. What does that look like for Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi in full color on the news, bowing down and curtsying and bowing down and kissing the ring of a Roman pontiff? The men who founded our great nation would throw up with this treason, high crimes and treason against the state by these people who call themselves America's leaders. I'm telling you, the Vatican has given us the mafia, drug running, prostitution, terrorism, child, violence, child, child, child porno porno pornography, pornography, all of it. And the children that are disappearing. Um, are you familiar with Leo Zagami? Say it again. Leo Zagami. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've okay. heard, I've and, heard and him many he times. And he's talked about when he's gone back into the fold because they tortured him. But yeah. when he was out for a moment talking to us, he talked about underneath the Vatican is a huge reptilian base. I don't know. I wasn't there. But it wouldn't surprise me. Right. I don't know. So there it, is some kind of link up between the agenda of the Illuminati the Vatican who's heading all of that up, and this reptilian rollout that we, that, to get back to where we were talking about, yeah. and perhaps this, this so-called um, figure who is, who is taking the throne and the symbolism that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't shock me. I want to say something about Dan Brown's uh, movies. Um, okay. Angels and <laughs> Demons and... Um, yeah, and the other um, Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci Code. And now this new one. Is it really called the... Uh, what were, what were I think it's from? called the, the hidden symbol okay. or the secret symbol or something like that. Okay. Which my producer, my producer friend and I were going to do a movie and we were going to call it the hidden secret or the secret uh, symbol. I understand. And now there's... Uh, Dan Brown comes out. Secret. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have no respect whatsoever for Dan Brown. None. I have no respect for the man at all. Because as far as I'm concerned, he's plagiarized and stolen. And I don't like people who steal because I've had it happen to me. He stole from Holy Blood, Holy Grail, oh, isn't better. that right? Absolutely. He stole the whole thing. Mm -hmm. He stole the whole thing. Uh, that whole story, Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and all this other angels and demons, all of that he stole. Now let me tell you what I think. This is just my opinion. I think Dan Brown is a plant. I think he's nothing more than a paid lackey and a plant. Uh, I am totally sure that the real Illuminati, whoever these guys are at the top of the world, use people like Dan Brown who don't mind making a lot of money to become a whore. And I think that's all he is. In my humble opinion, I think Dan Brown's just a whore. He's just taking the money and, and uh, sleeping with the enemy. Because I think what he's doing is he is nothing more than presenting what his masters behind the scenes want the public. And so they will spend all kinds of money telling you about how wonderful Dan Brown is and go, oh my God, he's so brilliant and intelligent and all this silly nonsense. And the people who are so used to sucking up to Hollywood will believe that stuff. Me, I've been around Hollywood 44, 48 years. I know this stuff backwards and forwards. I think Dan Brown is nothing more than a front for 
a very powerful Masonic order in Europe, which is trying to lay the foundations for this Novas Ordo Cyclonum, dawn of a new day, sunrise thing that's coming. I think Dan Brown is nothing more than a whore taking the money and making it look like he's the one that came up with this, when in point of fact, no, it was stolen. It was stolen from three men in England, Bajent, Lee, and Lincoln. Back in 1980, there was a book put out and it became a New York bestseller for many, many months. It was a top of the line bestseller called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And the three authors were three British authors, Bajent, Lee, and Lincoln. And they outline for the first time the story of the Knights Templar Masonic Order in Europe, the Knights of the of the Holy of the Holy Grail, um, the, the 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 whole concept of a Masonic secret society operating in the world. And I would be a bit surprised if they weren't uh, better informed about this than what they let us know. I don't think they just might chance happen upon it. I think. They already knew something and they were putting it out in the book in such a way as to start people thinking about it. But nonetheless, Bajent, Lee, and Lincoln were extraordinarily brilliant writers and their research was impeccable. I mean, these guys nailed it down. And even today around the world, uh, people who are knowledgeable in these subjects will agree. Bajent, Lee, and Lincoln did one hell of a job. They, they had their, their, their homework done. Okay, well, I have one, one last question, um, and, and this has been an amazing journey to take with you, and, and I, I hope that we can go down that, that road a little further in the, in the future, and I think that uh, people that are watching this really need to get up to speed with, with you know, following your other work, your previous work, uh, hopefully attending any conferences you're speaking at. I believe that you are coming forward, you just spoke. Um, Right, you know, you had no preparation whatsoever and you spoke at our, our Awake and Aware uh, Camelot conference here in Los Angeles uh, just last weekend and it's really an honor to be here with you. Um, but I want to ask you if you think that this Illuminati and, and what's going on in the United States right now, do you really think that they are going to be successful in taking down this country because it's clear that there is someone protecting you, there is a group protecting you. They certainly have some amazing powers, as you've demonstrated. Do you think that these powers, these Illuminati people behind the scenes, are going to be successful at taking down the United States yes, government? Yes, I totally agree. Yes, that's what okay. I think. Okay, and, and is that, I mean, you do have people beh behind the scenes that are protecting you. You've demonstrated that time and time again on this video. Right. Um, they are therefore, in theory, protecting us here, Project Hamlet, and other of our witnesses and so on, because we are all talking about the same thing from different angles I'm and sorry. getting our research together and right. so on. But in essence, what I'm wondering is there are white hats operating, as you know and as we know, because yeah. we have been interacting with those people from time to time. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible that these people can be stopped? No. You don't? No, I do not. Okay. I categorically say no. I do I not believe there is any reasonable um, evidence of, of anything of hope for America or for the world. That's my personal opinion. I think that the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming. There's no doubt in my mind, for myself, I do not believe America or the world at large is going to be able to extricate itself out of this situation. No, I do not believe it's possible. And the reason why is because the people are too stupid. They're too ill-informed, ignorant, ill-informed, unread, self-centered, egotistical, materialistic, and downright stupid. And they don't care. Basically speaking, people don't care. Ludwig von Mises, in one of his books, the great uh, European economist, Ludwig von Mises said, and, that was, and he's right on as far as I'm concerned, he said that every age 
and in every country, the people of every nation have always supported a dictator. The people have always supported a dictator, and they always will. There's never been a time in the history of the human race that you can show me where the people of a nation rose up and demanded their freedom, liberty, and justice for all. Not even in America. 97% of the male population in America at the time of the American Revolution did nothing. Only 3% took up arms against the British masters and gave us a modicum of freedom. But happily, that will never happen again. America is finished. Did his father of the girlfriend that you had, when he spoke to you, did he tell you that we're doomed? I mean, why would he call it a UFO? And why would he tell you all these things if we were just going down the toilet? Did he tell you that we were doomed? Did he tell you there was a war and that we were going to lose no matter what? No. Do you, okay, let, let me phrase this. Do you realize that you, your mission and your call to arms, which is really coming right on the verge here, I mean, I think that the new release of V is, is sort of a signal to the populace, a last-ditch attempt to wake the people up as to what may be coming. And basically, you have a mission, we have a mission, and I'm sorry, you know, Jordan Maxwell, and, and you're a brilliant man, but you were put here for a reason. You have incredible force behind you. The man who spoke to you all those years ago and told you, that you would have a journey is certainly behind you now and I would say that judging from everything that's gone on with Project Camelot that we have some of the same force behind us and I have to say that the fact that you're sitting here today and you're talking to us and you're alive and well and that you're coming forward at this moment and talking about things with, with really no holds barred is indication to me that there is something going on that's more than you you have dreamed of in your philosophy. So I want to thank you very much. Well, I, I, I want to answer that question. I do not believe America can be saved. I, hear I do not believe the human race can be extricated or saved from what is coming. I do not believe that my mission here is to save anybody. I believe what I am doing is to help those who want to know those handful of people who are awakening and who sincerely spiritually understand the dynamics of what's going on and who want to know and want to change and want the protection of the spirit that's a small modicum of people a very small niche i do not believe america can be saved i'm doing what i'm doing only to help those who want to know Obviously, you are a person who is trying to wake up people, okay? And sometimes there has to be a severe word told to the people in order to actually get them to awaken. And I do believe that this is part of your mission. But I will thank you for, from Project Camelot. I hope that you are wrong about your final judgment on the human race. I do too. And, and I'm sure you do too. Absolutely. That's why I'm trying to do whatever I can to help those who want to know, and hopefully it may spread. Thank you. Thank you.